All right, for all of you guys who are watching this after the live stream, welcome. Um, this is me and Larry doing our annual live stream. Uh, this is my third live stream. I've been doing one each year. Larry joined me for 2020 and he's back for 2021. Larry, you want to introduce yourself to those who are watching later? Hi, uh, I'm, I'm one of uh, Brad's longtime friends and uh, I think uh, for the last year or two, we've been uh, hanging out on a annual live stream, unboxing and tinkering with uh, all sorts of different cool new products and uh, Thank you for joining the stream and we hope you enjoy it. All right. Cool. I'm going to be monitoring the stream on my trusty 2020 MateBook X Pro, which is the subject of the previous year's live stream. And um, for those of you who are into laptops, the entire stream is run off of that tiny little Spectre X360 14, which is my daily driver currently. But Will that be dethroned by the framework laptop? That is the question we're going to answer today. So I have here newly arrived uh, batch one frame, framework laptop with the top of the line specs. We've got the i7 1185G7. We've got uh, bought outside of uh, framework, 64 gigs of RAM and a two terabyte 980 Pro SSD. And I've got a bunch of ports, as you may have heard, the framework laptop has uh, different ports that you can install into the laptop as modules. So let's... Um... So, so it's interesting that you mentioned you got the memory yeah. outside of the uh, framework ecosystem mm -hmm. because when you first ordered it i remember uh, you you mentioned that you were going to get the uh upgrade from them but then uh, i guess i sort of reminded you that these computers are designed for <laughs> end users to bring their own components and i sort of mentioned well well you could always find your own memory yeah <laughs> so I yeah think, and, uh, um, framework go ahead there there is some degree of um, markup on frameworks components. I yeah, think. a little bit. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, and I so think that it's about in line with the industry. Mm -hmm. um, they definitely don't. I mean, currently at least, they are not coming off as a ripoff company at all. Um, they're actually one of the most mm -hmm. likable, in my opinion, right now. Um, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So so okay. So we've got the laptop out. That's the first thing I wanted to see. Obviously, we'll get to the accessories later. But this is. First impressions built so well um, for such metal, a repairable right? laptop. The entire thing is metal. Uh, let me let me check the mm -hmm. keyboard deck. Um, I think it's entirely metal. One thing metal. I would be yeah. One thing I would be interested in is how much of it is actually solid metal and how much of it is like a skin over a plastic frame. Right. That's one of the things I couldn't really tell from the. Can you open it? With yeah, you're talking hand? about that plastic over molding they do in the inside. Yeah. Yeah. Can you um, can you tell if the can you tell if you can open it with one hand? Well, let's let's try it out. A lot of people like <laughs> I think a lot of people <laughs> like that feature. Yeah. So. Uh, I guess you close it. You close it yep, all the way. It opens with one hand. One yep. It does. It does open with one oh. hand. Oh, from from totally closed. Mm-hmm. Check this out. Perfect. Well, you have your other finger on it. Okay, there we go. Oh, <laughs> you're noticing okay. the delay. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so um, I will get to the laptop in a little bit. Let's just get through the entire box first, then we'll come right back to the framework laptop. So what else is in here? Paperwork and their nice um, included tool with a Torx 5 and a Philips Zero bit. You can swip, swap, uh, swap that around and uh, a spudger on the other end. Is it magnetic? Yeah, uh, <laughs> it seems like people love this tool as much as the laptop itself. So the problem with that tool that I see is that there's a spudger on the other end. So what some people like to do when they use screwdrivers. Oh, is it's going to dig into your palm the... if you use the palm method. Oh, yeah. Because yeah. uh, like iFixit's tools, right? They have like that spinny cap. Yeah, I love that. That's like the, the prime feature. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so th Does there's nothing kind of else in the uh, laptop box itself, so I'm gonna dig into the... I didn't order a charger from them. Oh, okay. But does it have a place for a charger? Like, will they ship it in here? Um, I don't think so, because the... Oh, uh, you, you don't open it that way. You open it. Uh, there's a pull tab to open. You're going to be a rebel. Hmm? Where's that? You're going to be such a rebel. Uh, there, there's a there's a pull tab to open on that bag. Oh. Uh, oh, you're talking about the bag. Oh, okay. Yeah, there's a pull tab to open. Um, some of those bags have, like, is it like wool or something in uh -huh. it? That if you rip the bag open, it'll just make a mess. Oh. <laughs> I just use the cable method. If... All right. Uh, so here yeah. are, in a few seconds, you're going to see um, the... Uh, Expansion ports that I ordered. I didn't order all of them. The only one that's missing actually is the display port module. Um, I have two so USB you have a USB C one. Yes, that's why I didn't order the display port because I already have a USB C to display port cable. So okay. let's start loading up the modules. Um, so, so I did notice uh, the. I think you got the DIY edition, but it looks like the computer has been pre-assembled for you. Yeah, so I think um, even the, I mean, as far yeah. as this batch, the DIY edition still has all the stuff in it already. Um, so I think uh, the reason they did that, I did see their blog post on it, is because, uh, so I think uh, some shipping companies, uh, there's actually a difference uh, when you ship lithium batteries Mm -hmm. "Quote unquote," contained in a device. Oh, yeah, it's easier to ship them than if they're shipped packed with. You know, them. funny you mentioned that. I'm actually dealing with that sort of problem at work right now. Oh, you're shipping lithium batteries. Out? I'm not, but mm -hmm. um, the product that I manage is uh, it contains lithium batteries. Um, so uh, we're having some problems importing those to some Asian Pacific countries the batteries oh the, the key fobs yeah the key fobs oh those lith those tiny lithium batteries oh yes. man <laughs> last time last time i had someone ship me a computer with a key wait wait a second does it have a white piece that just sticks like that is that is oh. that by design that um, white uh... yeah i guess it's for you to grip it more easily perhaps it doesn't look well, it's the interesting best. that they would uh, it's interesting that they would make that uh, make that white though. It seems like in we didn't see that in the pictures. Hmm. Did, we? Did it look completely flush in the pictures? Uh, I think in the pictures, if I remember correctly, it was uh, just totally gray. It was just mm. gray all the way through. Well, this one is sort of a. It might even be a color matching issue because it is slightly gray. It's not totally white. It's not the brightest white. I mean, but... if you if you look, I don't know if you're seeing the stream. Uh, on camera, it looks really white. Yeah, it is lighter than the aluminum surrounding. Well, it's, it's, it's here's what I will light. say. It looks like. Here's what I will say. I prefer it if it if it's gonna like. I'd rather have it be a very different color than a similar color, but still slightly different, right? Oh, okay. Because then it you get into like you yeah. know when when you get like. Uh, you know, like in collision repairs, when you get your bumper fixed and they, oh. the, they try to color match, but the plastic bumper oh, always looks yeah. different from the rest of the car. You don't oh. want that. So I'd rather it be a totally different color. So do you remember, uh, so here's the thing, you know, if Google made this laptop, mm -hmm. they would totally have made them different colors. Like they would make a, All they colorful. would make one. No, it would be, one of them would be, one of them would be, Red, one would be yellow, one would be green, and one would be blue. And <laughs> and actually, you know, if Notchua made this, they would make that piece swappable. And like the Chromax thing, you can, you know, you can put whatever color you want in. Right. Okay. So before you insert all of those, actually, uh, mm -hmm. you want to maybe show one of them in detail. Sure. So I'm going to show the see, last uh, uh, micro SD card module in detail, which is the one that I was going to insert next. So. so how does that latch work? 
Um, so you can see that there's this little tooth right here. Oh. The stream is coming to it's you. One side. <laughs> uh, it's one side. Nope, it, it's there on the other side as well. Cool. So um, let's look at the corresponding mechanism on the chassis. Um, so actually, um, you're, you're, you're right. So the modules have it on both sides, but the paw that comes out on the chassis is on one side because it's the side that has the button, uh, the release button. So the module itself, uh, is the bottom metal or is it plastic? Uh, it's metal. It's aluminum, the same material as the chassis. Oh, I'm, and I don't mean the release. I mean the bottom of the uh, module. Yes. Uh, the video is coming to you in a few seconds, Larry. <laughs> yes. Oh, cool. Yeah. Um, I guess we can't do much else without putting the SSD in. And so that necessitates taking the modules out, I presume, before disassembling the laptop. Whoops. Yeah, I think you need to... I think you only need to do that. Oh, you have to press that. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, is that so, button to release them, is that all chunky? Like, do you get a, a tactile? It actually, okay, so it looks button? like there's a, it feels like there is a soft spring and then followed by a tactile switch. Cool. Okay. Cool. So I'm going to dig into the screws now and uh, open this up. Yep. And so I have actually very little background. Larry probably knows more about this laptop than I do. Um, I'm coming into this pretty much blind. So it'll be interesting to see how a person with some experience in repairing or tinkering with laptops, but no particular knowledge in this specific model would fare in uh, getting this apart. Well, I won't uh, spoil it for you. <laughs> So I'll try from, not to anyway. Ah, yes. Okay, so the keyboard deck is up, and there's a there's a finger loop that you pull on the keyboard deck connector, and the keyboard deck is out. Oh, I love that new laptop smell. Well, does it smell like a Apple laptop? That's a good question. Um. No, it does not smell like an Apple laptop. It smells more like a Lenovo. And I think that actually makes sense because uh, Framework is composed uh, partially of ex-Lenovo employees. And so some of the designs oh, may be slightly common. <laughs> yeah, and so, that so might I have translated that. to the smell that of the glue, etc. That's one of the first things I noticed about this when I saw it was that it, it really reminded me of something uh, that Lenovo would make. Yeah, and also um, notice the fan right here. I feel like they might have accessed the same supplier as Lenovo because you well, yeah, see like the number like a... of uh, fins on this fan. Now, mind the you, all right laptops now have that fin design now. Oh, okay, uh, that's Dell, cool. HP... Uh, they all use the same fans now. Okay. All right. But you know, it does look like a Lenovo. Uh, <laughs> just the just the just the feelings I'm yeah. getting here. Man, it's such a beautiful uh, internal uh, space right here. It's <laughs> it's obviously designed to be seen, and I like that a lot. So um, let's see. We already have. Uh, are we gonna try scanning any of the QR codes? <laughs> uh, I don't think that's that interesting. I mean, it leads to a web page. Uh, it's either, I mean, I'm expecting one of two results, right? A web page where you have pictures and or videos of how to swap the component out or the web page isn't up yet. 
So either of those okay. wouldn't be all that interesting. <laughs> cool. So interestingly enough, that CPU heatsink, it has a big plate over what looks like uh, the voltage regulation. Yeah, um, it, the CPU die and the VRM share the same um, cold plate. But on the other hand, if you if you look at how they mount the heatsink, uh, it doesn't look like it uh, looks like a, it doesn't look like a very very heavy mounting pressure sort of design. It looks like a well, I mean it's about typical for a laptop. But... Hmm. Okay, so Let's see how that turns. Yeah. Mm. This connector, okay, so here's the battery connector. I unplugged it just to be safe when... It comes unplugged, right? Uh, nope, it was plugged in before. So all of the screws of this thing are pre-installed, right? Yeah. Okay. I am sort of interested in uh, whether or not the DIY edition, how they're going to organize all the screws because... As we all know, there's many different types of screws on a typical laptop, and that could be a little bit of a challenge. Yeah. But I think, if anything, this is the least concerning laptop screws-wise, because mm -hmm. you'll have tons of imagery to refer to if you mix oh, up yeah, your screws. For sure. So I'm just... Pushing in the Can you... the RAM and you know what the 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 RAM retention mechanism feels kind of weird on this one. I gotta say. Uh, are you sure it's not because your RAM's uh, too thick? Uh, that could uh, be. You know. There's a cable underneath. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, the uh, the cable's like elsewhere. Um, oh, now you're just jamming it in, aren't you? Yep, just jamming it in. Hey, you know, if it stays in place, then uh, I don't have a problem. It look like these are thick modules. Yeah, we the might be approaching. We might be approaching the uh, upper limits of <laughs> what this slot can handle. It is thirty-two is gigs really... per module. Though, is it... most modules are dual-sided, though. Yeah. Um, this maybe a, this, this one has a, an extra thick heat spreading sticker or something. Maybe no. Oh, it has sticker. that on the bottom. But no, it's a sticker. It yeah, it's just a sticker. Uh, I don't know, dude. It, it, it might it, just be a tolerance thing or like the tuning of the clips. You know, it might just dude, be that. You had to jam it in there. <laughs> you really had to jam it in. There. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's in. Yeah, and then um, let's grab our SSD. So I got this, I really liked um, this deal I got on the SSD. I got it for like $100 have, off from uh, someone on Craigslist. <laughs> we actually have a, we have a replaceable Wi-Fi card, right? Did you buy a Wi-Fi card with it? Oh, good question. Um, I think I did. Uh, here it is. I remember on here, the website. It's, yeah, it's, uh, in the, it's in this Ziploc bag. I have it. Okay. Did you buy that by yourself or? No, I got it from Framework. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's too lazy to compare prices and stuff. Oh, yeah. Just, yeah, it's a Wi Fi card, you know. Okay. All right. So I guess I'll put in the Wi Fi card first. Um, so so this again. actually this brings us to a total of three M2 slots in here. Yep. Wait. Uh, so supposedly. Wait, why three? Only needed so one the SSD, SSD and then the Wi-Fi card and then what else? Uh, looks like there's two uh, two spaces for SSDs now. No, actually, just one. Um, What's that slot for? Oh, that's one? for the Wi-Fi card. Uh, so the cool. one that looks like an SSD slot is just like an empty. Uh, it's just a black uh, ribbon cable, or something. Oh, it's a cable. No, it's not a cable. It's actually just a sticker. It, it's just um, a shield kind of thing. Yeah. Because it looks so much like an SSD slot. Yeah, it does. Um, Camera focus is uh, kind of gone out. Oh, because it's focusing on my head? 
Uh, no, it's still out. Hello, hello. Come on, don't do this, Sony. Sony, you're supposed to have the best focus. There is a uh, there's magic. There are magic words that you use to make the camera focus. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think it's preferring to focus on your hand. Um. Oh, I see how it's out of Okay, so it's back in focus. Yep. Yep. Okay. Cool. Um, so the Wi-Fi oh, card is in, and I'm going to put in the SSD now. So I really like the Samsung Pro series. Uh, I mean, I guess that's kind of an obvious statement. Oh, I think you it's forgot to put it. something. You've, I think you've forgotten to install something. Um, the uh, cover plate over the Wi-Fi card, and you've also had you oh, also have the antennas. For yeah, the I have the antennas under, under the. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is what happens when I try to like manage focus and talk to you and install a computer at the same time. <laughs> I just don't have the multitasking power to do it. I guess we're testing how idiot-proof this computer is by being an idiot. That's what I'm doing. I mean, <laughs> I mean, in a way, I feel like you know, I feel like this is something that could easily be overlooked. Uh, I, like, I would, I would think that they should put like a flag of tape on it saying, "Don't forget to connect me," <laughs> because this is actually an an amazingly common uh, problem. Uh, people will actually go on forums and say. Hey, you know my my uh, my computer has Wi-Fi, but the signal is much worse than it is on my phone or laptop or something. And you know what's wrong? Someone will be like, "Well, you have to connect the antenna." And they're like, "What antenna?" And <laughs> and, and someone's like, "Oh, it's that it's that it's that like uh, it's that thing that looks like a sailboat thing that came with the motherboard. It should be in the box." And they're like, "You mean this weird plastic thing?" And, and they're like, "What? Where, where does it go into?" And I'm like. Oh, you know those uh, two round things in the back uh, of the motherboard? And they're like, oh, that's how it works. Because they're like, oh, I thought the Wi-Fi was built into the motherboard. Oh. <laughs> and you're like, yeah, but it's the antenna. I think those are just the caps, heat shrink or something. Yeah. I see that uh, little cover plate is a little bit of a... The antennas are a little long. I mean, on the other hand, I think they're trying to support a variety of Wi-Fi cards. Yes. So they kind of have to make them long. Yeah, that, that makes sense. But I will say that antenna cables are sort of a... I would hope that the antennas are a replaceable part because uh, those connectors you're using right now, mm -hmm. they're actually only rated for about five cycles. Oh, so if you take them off and put them on five times, mm -hmm. in theory, you're supposed to change them. Okay, so I've never seen this kind of um, shield over the connectors before. I think all computers, OEM computers anyway, tend to have this shield because they switch to the smaller, um, the smaller type of uh, antenna connectors. And mm -hmm. Those don't stay in very well without help. Yeah, I think on the MateBook X Pro, it was... I think there's a locator pin on that, yeah. There's a locator pin in the case. No, actually, uh, for the MateBook X Pro, it was just the mother... Uh, it was just the heatsink. Yeah. The heatsink actually uh, served this purpose because it went over everything. Wait, there was a heatsink? Oh, no, right, right, like right. because like the right. giant yeah. you know, heatsink that goes over the entire motherboard that. region. Yeah, so oh, I yeah. think it goes on like this because there's a locating hole right there. Yeah. And now we move on to the SSD. That's nice.
Oh, you know, it's been a while since I've seen an actual button cell battery on a laptop. Well, I think they're trying to make it uh, replaceable. Yeah, do other laptops use some kind of uh, super capacitor well, or what do they use? So half of the laptop, so half of laptops nowadays don't actually have anything. And that's actually because the battery on most computers nowadays is no longer removable. Right. So because yeah, so when you the battery unplug the battery, not, it you know, resets the time and BIOS, yeah, etc. And, yeah, and because, you know, UEFI, the operating system, can fix all of the time issues and whatnot. Yeah. Yo, I love the fact that they have all the people on the on the team written on the... What is this module here? I guess this is just the... Um, that's the top of the uh, expansion card. Yeah, it's it's like the housing for the expansion cards. They have the team members yeah. on there. Okay, I've reconnected the battery. Are we going to check out the thermal paste job, or are we not? Um, yeah, let's do it. Uh, or do, do you want to do that after you've benchmarked it or something? Or yeah, tested it? we can also do that. Yeah. yeah. I don't really mind either way because it's not like I'm trying to get any scientific results from this live benchmark. Um, there's tons of other people doing benchmarks, and I don't think I have the time to... Well, I guess let's, uh, let's just... Uh, if, if we're going to open it, probably do it now before it's all you know, together. All right. I think, I think that's an important one too, you know, just to see how they're... <laughs> yeah, doing. okay. And then I'll get my jumbo thermal, thermal paste, paste uh, syringe out. That uh, connector is also a Lenovo type of thing. Which one? The keyboard one. That's, uh, that's the same thing Lenovo uses. Oh, this one? Uses. Yeah, and Lenovo so actually the has a battery connector looks... I mean, they all look... I, I can't say I'm that well versed on connectors, but you're saying, Larry, that the uh, it's the exact same connector. Well, it's not the exact same. It's like the same concept. Uh, the the way Lenovo laptops go together, mm -hmm. I think I think it's easy to tell. You know that this, as you said, I think there's some Lenovo engineers right. here at Framework. So going think, back uh, to what you were saying, Larry, about um, mm. screws not being the same and being able to identify them, etc. So many of the screws are actually retaining. Oh. So that helps. You don't have yeah, to remember. That's really helpful. Uh, so the heatsink screws are retaining, the... the fan screws are retaining. Does the heatsink come out without the fan? Um, I'm not sure it really matters. It but looks like not. a single piece. It's uh, not it looks like a onerous. single sub assembly. Okay. So anyone that wants to clean it is going to have to. So you know what's interesting? This uh, this computer appears to lack the anti-clogging design that most of their laptops have adopted. And what is the anti-clogging design? So most laptops these days, you'll notice, um, the fan does not connect directly to the heatsink. There usually is a gap right across the top of the fan, hmm. and there's a gasket. So what they'll do is they'll actually have the air blowing over the top of the heat pipes. Mm -hmm. and, and the reason they'll do that is because that's like, that's like usable surface area. Yes. Uh, so as well as... I don't know if they meant to do this. But What's on the back? There's a very slight uh, slot, but it's it's like it act the air actually has to kind of do a Z bend to get to it. Yeah, I don't think that's I don't think that was uh, for that purpose. But um, the other thing that you get when you have that gap is it's much it's a much higher velocity path, I would say. So what you're basically doing is you're having dust just uh, spitting out the sort of like that uh the the spillway if you call it that and uh that way it doesn't collect on the heatsink and 
it's a very effective design, actually. Hmm. Okay, so, so there's your I thermal. I dropped pad. a little thermal pad. I think it belongs here. I think it goes over those two little MOSFETs next to the CPU. Does it not? Um, uh, from yeah, the uh, imprints uh, on the cold plate, they go right here. Okay. So it's this is Did a pretty decent the... sized fan for uh, even even if it's just one of these for a thirteen point five inch laptop. Did they uh, silk screen the locations of the thermal pads on the board? Um, they have not. They so so this is so this is sort of important, right? Because uh, we're having this issue, but you know, I, I assume that a lot of users are gonna have a similar problem. Where do the thermal pads go? Right. So that would have to they would have to refer to imagery. But do they have? <laughs> Maybe you want to show the uh, numbers and letters on the side of the fan on camera. On the side of the fan. Oh, the uh, fan. The fan. There's there's like a model information and whatnot. Yeah. So uh, that may. Uh, that I don't may know. Actually interest someone. I don't know what logo this is. Once you, I think you can see it better from the other side. Yeah, just try to get it at an angle. Um, probably get closer because it's uh, the focus is off. I see a tube logo. Well, that's a safety cert. I'm just waiting for the focus. The uh, focus is failing us. <laughs> Uh, you want to move that? Uh... Oh, I see it. Okay. It was on the screen for a fraction of a second. It's some miscellaneous manufacturer fans. So, um, I think the paste job is not bad. It's machine applied. Well, it's actually, if you can see, it's actually a square that they just print onto it and then yes. they just clamp it down which is standard i guess idea. it's pretty standard well i mean that type of paste can be very effective uh, as we all know you know the intel stock coolers mm -hmm. they come with thermal paste on the bottom yes. and as it turns out uh, i think a couple of years ago well this is more than a couple of years ago Tom's Hardware, I think, uh, did a review on Intel stock coolers and the thermal paste they came with. And they wiped off the original thermal paste. And mm -hmm. it turns out they could not find any commodity thermal paste at that time that performed as well as with that cooler as what came up. Huh. And when was that? Uh, which is... This is back in the Pentium 4 days. Oh, but okay. Intel hasn't really changed their stock coolers. Right. I mean, uh, they've made so them smaller, which would since only then, make this... Since then, commercially yeah. available aftermarket thermal pastes have made, uh, you know, giant leaps in progress, so... Though, on the other hand, um, they were using some pretty standard, you know, like, was it Dow Corning or something? Thermal paste? Okay. It's interesting. So you can tell they really uh, put some effort into... Um, put some effort into the... Uh, Into the what? Into the uh, into the VRM. I just uh, oh, I, th I think I've uh, accidentally missed something in the chat. 
Um, T Quick says, hopefully it lasts longer than your previous made books. <laughs> um, Stripey Snake says, got, er, got, got other things I gotta do. Love the framework. Well, um, thanks for joining briefly. <laughs> Yeah, I'll try to keep an eye on that closer. So yeah, my mate books, I guess, so two of my three mate books are currently surviving and still serving duty. Uh, my first mate book was killed with liquid metal thermal paste, or rather, it's not the thermal paste that kills laptops, it's people who kill laptops. <laughs> and that person was me. So, I'm guessing no liquid metal on this one yet. <laughs> Not yet, because I don't want to go too far from stock um, in my performance evaluation. Oh, yeah, fair. Yeah, it doesn't take much to get back in here, you know. Oh, yeah, for sure. This is so interesting thing to know. Uh, if you you know, I guess you can look at that later so you don't, uh... but, um, you'll notice that you see in the corners, there's that conductive paint, that copper colored, that pinkish copper colored, uh, coating, um, around the edges, you'll see it. And that's what made me think this was made out of plastic internally, because what it looks like is Part of this laptop. Oh, is this one right here. Plastic. Yes. Part of the laptop is actually plastic, and it's just a piece of metal that wraps it. Actually, you are absolutely correct. So, um, that this, looks like a little. Okay, so so here's the difference between um, the construction of this versus the construction of the MacBook X Pro or the Apple MacBook Pro, for example. Um, this chassis is made of stamped aluminum. So it's sheet metal with close to uniform thickness that was um, just stamped by a stamping press. And that is the, perhaps the fastest way to make a laptop chassis. But because it has to be kind of a, you know, it has to be sheet metal, um, you don't get fancy features like threaded studs um, or anything like that. So uh, in order to have uh, those female threads to mount all of your components, um, they add this plastic overmolding, this plastic inner uh, layer, which you can see are the black plastic all around here, all under there, and sometimes it appears pinkish as well. Um, they use that to provide extra complex geometry inside the laptop. And then inside those, they actually use threaded inserts that are heat pressed in to actually provide the threads for mounting. Compare that to so, the MacBook Pro, you've just got a single billet of aluminum that was subtractively machined uh, with those studs uh, being revealed with by the machining and then they just tap those uh, studs to mount all of the components. So that is a more elegant um, and efficient method, but costlier method. I sort of wanted to jump in here uh, and say, you know, so one of the things about the framework laptop is it aims to reduce the environmental impact associated with the associated with manufacturing and disposal of electronics. Yes. Uh, aluminum is actually very energy intensive to recycle and to, to smelt. Mm. And you know, those uh, unibody machined enclosures are inherently very wasteful of aluminum because if you think about uh, how, how like, say, a MacBook enclosure is made, mm -hmm. it's it starts out as a solid block of aluminum. Yes. And they carve out pretty much everything inside of it just to leave, you know, a little a skeleton which forms the frame for your laptop. But yes. all of that extra aluminum, that takes a lot of energy to recycle. Absolutely. Now, so one of the interesting ways that, so one of the main, I would say, challenges with 
these plastic inserts on laptops is the hinge area. So as anyone that's worked in laptop computer repair can probably attest to, the first location for laptops to break is at those thread, threaded inserts that are um, heat staked into the, into the plastic. And what happens is over time, the plastic cracks and then it lets go of the little uh, brass screw bosses. Yes. And then the laptop hinge breaks. Now, what Dell used to do with their XPS computers, and I think they still do it, but Dell has been moving towards using aluminum in general. But what they would do is they would have a little bracket of cast aluminum. So they, they would actually be casting this. So this is also very cheap and high volume, very mm -hmm. light. They'd be using a magnesium out aluminum alloy, which is very light as well. And what they would do is they would build a little bracket to sit, to screw the hinge into. And they would have like a big piece of, they would have like a piece of that, that they would then go and screw into plastic. So the benefit of that was, would be that you have a magnesium alloy piece, uh, sort of spreading that, uh, that torque from the screen opening across a larger area and across a larger number of fasteners and that was how they sort of approached the we don't want the screen to break at the at the little mm, okay brass uh inserts problem it looks like on the framework laptop there are uh more than normal screws holding the screen in. and it looks like they've given it a little bit of a little bit more of a lever arm than they normally would and it looks like the screws that uh, the screws from the bottom of the laptop actually come through and hold it down so i'm inclined to think this one might be fine um, but that isn't necessarily one of my favorites I do prefer not to see laptops designed this way anymore just because the industry is sort of moving on from screen hinges screwed into brass bosses heat pressed into plastic mm -hmm. but um, yeah so before i close are... down this laptop is there any other comments that you would make uh about uh any of the components you're seeing well, here? i want to i want to i want to see the speaker because uh as we all know those are a popular topic channel <laughs> okay um so it looks like the speakers don't have any screws on them which is actually potentially a good thing for uh, avoiding yep, nasty rubber. resonances and vibrations and whatnot. Um, is there foam on the other side? No, there actually is no foam. Uh, no, there is a little little foam block. Um, so I okay. think the let the camera focus. Let the camera focus. The camera's not so focused. I'm gonna zoom in a little bit here. Uh, sorry about the camera shake. It's on a cantilevered arm. So the speaker is supported by three soft um, sort of components, oh, I yeah. guess. Mm -hmm. um, so you've got the foam block right here, and then you've got the rubber grommets on these two um, locating holes. And, Would uh, you like to put the speaker next to something you know the size of? later measure the sure you you want to compare it to a matebook x pro speaker i think i have one of those laying around yeah because uh just because um so it's interesting because the dell xps 15 mm -hmm. uh, 9500 which i've actually just ordered one of okay uh, has speakers that look very much like the same size as the one framework laptop. okay and according to notebook check the speakers in that machine are amazing so, as we've previously seen, some of the best performing speakers in notebooks have been Apple's. Yeah. And Apple's speakers have traditionally been a lot larger. Um, but it seems like Dell was able to do the same with normal-sized speakers. Uh, you might want to watch the camera position uh, a little bit off camera. Okay. But, uh, oh, yeah. So, okay, so on the left is the Matebook X Pro speaker, and that has been pretty much the same for the past three generations. Um, 
and on the right is the framework laptop speaker. Um, so the shape the is different. The uh, MXP speaker is an L-shaped speaker. And also, I guess more importantly, it has a tweeter in addition to the main woofer. The framework laptop the, does not appear to have a tweeter. But the woofers are the same size. Yes, the, the diaphragms themselves are almost exactly the same size. And they look very so, similar as well. That could uh, point to potentially wonderful uh, audio performance yeah. from the framework. Mm -hmm. Important to note is that the framework laptop, the speakers are actually firing straight out the top. Uh, on, the, on the Matebook, uh, only the tweeters fire up top and the woofer points down. Um, well, actually on the framework here, uh, the speakers are down firing. Oh, yeah, right. They are. I, I keep getting actually this mixed solely up. down firing. Oh, right. I, I sorry. I just keep getting it mixed up. I'm too used to seeing laptops with the bottom of. Yeah. <laughs> not the top. Yeah. There's All right. no mesh inside here. There's no grill. Uh, there's no grill mesh inside. No the grill mesh. Actual case. No mesh. So over time. Uh, little magnetic particles are going to migrate in and stick yeah. to the speaker. That's right. But I guess you have the option of coming in and cleaning those off. <laughs> yeah. Well, I just yeah, want to leave it out there. So, you know, if anyone's watching, thinking, oh, well, you know, um, well, I, I have uh, scratchy speakers, you know, what might be causing it? Well, now we know. Yeah. So um, one thing that I would like to find out is whether this laptop has Thunderbolt. It is not advertised to have Thunderbolt, but as we've seen with the 2020 MateBook X Pro, sometimes laptops that are not advertised to have Thunderbolt do in fact have Thunderbolt. So I'm hoping so, that is the case here, but... So I actually asked this exact question on their framework forums, mm -hmm. and... I think, if I remember correctly, they said that actually all four ports support USB 4, which is a subset of Thunderbolt. And they're working on certifying it, for, okay. but they don't have the certification yet, okay. which means they can't technically say it has Thunderbolt. But, but it also, quote unquote, does, which means <laughs> it probably, quote unquote, works with Thunderbolt, <laughs> but it doesn't have Thunderbolt. But would the drivers install on there like willingly? So, uh, so I think on Tiger Lake, the CPU actually contains the Thunderbolt controller. Okay. Um, barring that, USB four is actually backwards compatible with Thunderbolt three. So most uh, most devices out there are Thunderbolt three nowadays. Okay. So cool. I'm assuming they'll function fine. Um, unfortunately, all of my Thunderbolt devices are currently being used, so I will get back to you uh, on whether it will, on whether it actually does have Thunderbolt or not at a later so time. Do we have a touchpad? Does the touchpad rattle? Oh, haha. Uh, good callback to a uh, previous project. It does not. It feels really great, actually. Um, I'll put it back on and... So, actually, if you look at the back of the keyboard, there's a bunch of uh, letters that point to 4KB. What do those do? Um, Are those like screws for removing the actual keyboard? Yes. Oh. No? Yeah. Um, touchpad. Uh, nothing too special about it. Feels good. That's a no joke. rattle. Um, actually, it's it's not. There's a lot I mean, of screws for the keyboard. We'll we'll judge the touchpad after we put it back on because it will feel different when it's actually closed. Um, I do feel yeah. like the uh, the ports are. I mean, they're very interesting because the Thunderbolt connectors here, like, I think, okay, so I, I see I see what's happening. So the module for to receive all the connector modules, that itself is also, the housing itself is also replaceable. Uh, it's held down by some screws and um, a pair of uh, USB 4, USB-C ports. 
This does uh, use more internal space though. So you are, at the end of the day, you're always gonna be trading uh, space or uh, you know performance density, etc., for repairability or expandability. So um, even though so they've here's the actually thing, though. done quite well with with that compromise, like it doesn't feel but like a, a long... space constrained laptop or anything. But I think a lot of this, um, a lot of what they've been able to do here, you could, in theory, have a repairable laptop without having to make the the port modules as large as they did. Um, as That's I understand true. it, they made the port modules larger because they expect people to actually put hardware in the modules. Like, yes. I think they were talking There's about There's an, an SSD module. In. Uh, I think, yeah. Yeah. When, when you start getting into stuff like that, then these the module size starts making sense. Yes. But on the other hand, you know, you'll notice that, as you said, you know, it doesn't feel very space constrained in here. Um, yeah, it has everything I, that you'd want. It's not like the speakers are tiny. Uh, the battery is not tiny. Um, at 55 watt hours, though, it is tinier than what some manufacturers are. Yeah. Like, um, uh, Dell it's, is it It's in line with most other... Um, uh, that's about the same, isn't it? Yeah. The the Book same. X Pro is 57. Um, okay, so I'm having a little bit of trouble closing this corner right here. I wonder why that is. Is there a clip or maybe the speaker didn't go back in there? Uh, the speaker is back in because there's a protrusion on the locating studs that the speaker hmm. goes onto and it's, uh, it's in the right position. So, uh, well, your Wi-Fi cables are in pro that shouldn't be blocking it. So you know what you know what this design really reminds. Oh, did you plug the keyboard in? Yeah, I did. Okay. So one of the things that this really reminds me of is a Microsoft Surface Laptop Three. Yes, because of the and way that it disassembles. The way it opens, right? Yeah. The, the way it opens. Uh, and uh, Panos Panay, when he was announcing it, opened one on stage, and it was uh, pretty elegant. Mm -hmm. That design. You have to hand it to them. Um, now, the Surface, on the other hand, is actually an example of a space-constrained laptop. Um, it, it does not feel anything like this one. It, it simply doesn't have the space to do a lot of these things. But they managed to pack a lot of stuff in packed a, they managed to pack um, some pretty big speakers. Uh, yeah. So speaking of, um, well, actually they, speaking yeah. of performance density, I have another laptop on the way. It's coming this Tuesday. Uh, it is the Tsinghua Tongfang, uh, also known as Mech Revo F1. Oh. Have you heard of that F1. brand, Larry? I've heard of them uh, because they are frequently featured on laptop repair channels. <laughs> um, I'm really having some trouble with this corner here. <laughs> but um, that laptop uh, is, is quite a unicorn. Uh, it has, uh, it's the same sort of size as, as this. Um, it's 14 inches. It's the same size as, um, it's actually very close in specs to the X1 Carbon Gen 9 with a 14.0 inch 16 by 10 screen. Um, it weighs only 1.1 or less, somewhere around 1.1 kilograms. And it has a 35 watt i7-11370H processor. You're talking about the Mac Revo F1, right? Yes. You know what this looks like, right? What? It, it looks really close to the... Uh, it looks almost like a NUC reference design. Huh. You remember Intel came out with NUCs? Oh, the uh, NUC laptop? Remember Intel made a... Yeah, the NUC laptop. The, the NUC laptop is actually a... It's actually a really competent laptop. 
Okay, but so it's 15 inch. I tried um because I, I can't quite figure out the issue with the um frame not closing and I just screwed the screw in and it closed. I think it was just butting up against the retained screw. <laughs> okay, I see. Okay. So five screws to close the chassis. So uh, as for the Mech Revo F1, that um, that uh, that machine, I think uh, it's been reviewed by some people. Actually, I think it's under the name A Data XPG Xenia or something. Yes, I believe that's what it's called. Uh, the same chassis. Yeah, that's right. It's also a Schenker and a bunch of other names. Yes. Uh, they, all, they all work using... They all use the same... Uh... Yeah, it, it was the XPG Xenia. Okay, right off the bat, I'm not digging this keyboard. It's mushy. It has travel, but it's mushy. Would you say it's... Uh... You know, it's interesting because a lot of people said they really liked uh, the Lenovo um, keyboards. Back well, yeah, actually, this one does fun. not feel like a Lenovo keyboard. This one um, yeah. is softer. Uh, it's been a while since I felt a keyboard like this. It does not feel like the Lenovo. It does not feel like the Matebook. Um, it feels like, actually, it feels a little bit like the Matebook with more travel. And my fingers are quite spoiled by the Spectre X360 14, which is, in my opinion, the best ultrabook keyboard i have experienced to date um better than the classic macbook pros from 2011 um it is just so tactile it feels like a zelios v2 but in a laptop form factor um this one however it's it's mushier than that it has the travel but it's just kind of mushy and also the keyboard deck has more flex than i'm used to uh which is to be expected with this repairable laptop so anyway let's um plug this in um, so let's the see the fact here. that it's sort of been um they've sort of you know the key is being mushy uh, i think that's like one of the things with most things like things like a keyboard it's it takes an incredible amount of pickiness to get a good keyboard on yeah something. okay okay so i don't like the way i installed these uh modules and very fortunately we have the ability to change that. So I'm going to have um, USB-C's on both sides so we can charge the laptop from either side. Already making use of the Frameworks features. All right, so I have it plugged in and let's boot it up. I'm going to zoom the camera out. So I'm expecting some kind of bio screen at this point because um, there's no OS installed in the SSD yet. But right now I'm just getting the power light and uh, nothing else. So let's try giving it a boot device and see if that changes anything. So the, it, I don't know if my video is simply played. I don't see any video on the screen. That, yeah, that, that's what I'm saying. Like, there's no, uh, there's no video at all on the screen. In my experience, that's not normal. Yeah, it should, it should show like no boot device or something like that. Power lights on though. Right? Yeah. So I turned it off, and now we're gonna turn it back on again. I wonder if this is a RAM issue. Oh, no. <laughs> but it should be beeping if you don't give it RAM. Shouldn't it? Most laptops will boot and then they'll go beep, beep, beep. It's like, oh, your RAM's missing yeah. it. Not installed. Do you hear the fan? I hear the fan. 
I don't get any screen display. I wonder if the screen is somehow disconnected. Hmm. That's a... How do you, you know, take honestly, the screen off speaking, again? Oh, you just do this, right? It's just magnetic. Yeah, you know, one of the things is that things I've never trusted myself with anything expensive to actually not break it. And you know that feeling when you first put something together and it doesn't work? Like, uh oh, did I break it or did it come broken? Right. <laughs> and, and and you debate, right? Like with anything yeah. that you it's sort of like, well, is it was it my fault or was it, you know, this thing, right? Like Oh man, that's a Oh, I'm getting backlight. I'm getting, I mean, I'm getting like actual um, imagery on the, on the display now. I guess it just took a while to initialize the motherboard, perhaps. And it's booting right into the Windows installer. Great. It might have been doing a memory to all your memory. Oh, possible. Yeah, all right, let's, let's go through the Windows install. All right. So I like the resolution of this screen. I think it's just right. What is it like? Something 1500, something by 1500. Well, that would be a square. Um, no, 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 like 2000 something by 1500. I just know that like the dimension in height is 1500, which is Pretty nice, I would say. 1500 or 1536? Uh, I don't remember. I just know that it's somewhat close to 1500p. Okay, that's all I know. <laughs> and, and that should translate to a PPI of about 250 as a rough oh. guess. So yeah, um, and it looks that way too, so. I think it's a sweet spot um, for, uh, cause I'm just about able to see the jagged edges of the pixels if I come close, but at normal viewing distances, they do disappear. Um, anything more than that is just waste of resources. Yeah, I've seen a 4K 13 inch laptop. Yeah, I've had one. That was the uh, Razer you know, I, Blade I turned it, I Stealth. Turned it up to... I turned the scaling to a hundred percent just to, just as a oh, joke. Oh God! And I couldn't figure, out, and it was difficult to get it out of that. <laughs> so, um, while this is processing, I'd like to um, discuss a few different topics. Um, one thing that came across my mind recently is uh, oh, Windows cannot install required files. Hmm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Maybe T four five five asks, "How old is that Windows installer?" And it is an hour T old. Oh, and T Quick says, "Why are there so many sensors at the top? Is it Windows Hello ready?" Larry, can you confirm if this is Windows Hello ready? Uh, I'll figure that one out. It looks like Windows Hello. Um, so you've got, I guess. There, okay, so there's a webcam mm -hmm. in the center. There are switches for the microphone so the, and the camera. And then there's an ambient light sensor, I'm guessing. So and I think then, uh, the fingerprint sensor, they did say was Windows Hello capable. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't know if, how many cameras are in there. Just one? Uh, one camera, but like, isn't the... Uh, I mean, I can't really tell if, I, I can't tell what's in these tiny holes that are about 0 0.8 millimeters in diameter. Huh, we, uh... By the way, you know, um, this laptop is being a lot more compatible than my, uh, huh, interesting, unallocated space. Oh, is it having issues? Um, I've never, I've never seen the Windows installer act like this. I guess I'll just, act install like... it. it was just a minor thing. Like it, I couldn't delete the partition. Like it, it was, there was first an, uh, like 180 megabytes or so of an allocated space. Excuse me. 
And then so, there was uh, a yeah. partition and I couldn't delete the partition to turn it into just an allocated space for some reason, which I was always able to before. Okay, so um, uh, so actually I, I see it says that it has a 1080p webcam, but okay. it doesn't list Windows Hello under biometrics. It does say though that the power button has an integrated fingerprint reader compatible with Windows Hello. So I don't think it has Windows Hello, but I do think it does have Windows Hello. Okay. Windows Hello uh, fingerprint. Okay. All right. The so uh, the second succeeded. try succeeded. Um, oh, one minor comment is that the, uh, the laptop completely functions, except for backlight control, of course, completely functions in the Windows installer like you would expect a Surface device to, unlike the X, uh, X360 14, which uh, the touchpad does not work at all, nor does the touchscreen, although this one doesn't have a touchscreen, so and that's not a fair comparison. None of the hardware, none of the hardware on the Surface Pro works without installing the Surface Pro driver package. Oh, <laughs> wow, okay, Microsoft uh, being, uh, being so self-disconnected. Yes. <laughs> Uh, well, actually, you have to prepare a custom installer wow, with all the okay. drivers baked in because Microsoft are using some really non standard services. <laughs> okay, so while this is getting ready, um, I want to talk about connected standby. I think this is an issue that uh, mm. deserves more attention because I was at work. So if, if you haven't, um, I guess I haven't told anybody outside of my friend circle, but I'm currently interning at Tesla right now as an engineering program manager. I go to the office in Palo Alto, which is Tesla's HQ. And there we have, um, I guess, thousands of HP laptops, mostly ZBooks. So I have a ZBook from work. This is a ZBook 15 inch um, G7 with a hexacore i7 from 10th gen. So it's a generation old. Um, but it's pretty nice, got, it's got 32 gigs of RAM. But I, I uh, wanted to put it to sleep and leave my desk and I realized the external monitor that's connected to it via HDMI, uh, after I clicked sleep on the computer, the monitor continued to show my lock screen. And even the internal display continued to show a black screen with a cursor on it. That's after I pressed sleep. By the way, uh, the Wi-Fi card is not being recognized right now, so I guess we'll have to load the Wi-Fi driver afterwards. Which is a good thing, actually, because that forced, naturally, <laughs> the installer to not prompt uh, me to put in my Microsoft account, which is annoying. I guess you don't have internet. Otherwise, I would have like refused to connect to any Wi-Fi to force it into offline install. I don't actually have that somehow, much of a problem with Microsoft services. Somehow, I, I like feel to... like this is a. Somehow, I feel like this is. A, um, you left it all on. Uh, somehow, I feel like this is not a good sign because that that Wi-Fi card is an Intel. And from what I can tell, uh, Microsoft Windows should include drivers for the Intel. Mm, that was not the case for the X360-14, though. That had oh, an Intel AX201 Wi-Fi 6 card mm -hmm. um, built in, non-removable. And, oh, wow. Okay, so I'm on the framework uh, website on my laptop off to the corner, and there's a whole lot of drivers in here. Um, there's the BIOS. Oh, that's just the license. Um, Support. Interesting. So, where's... I mean, look at this. I don't, 
apologies, I don't have the uh, screen sh uh, screen sharing whatever on OBS right now. I'm just going to show this because I'm on this laptop anyway. But it's what is all this? Uh, oh, these are these are not the drivers themselves. These are licenses. These are just like yeah, licenses that you uh, that you download. What if we go to support? Wait, what? Wait, what? Where do you go download? The, I'm on the same page. I'm yeah, on the same those page are not and, downloads. And I, see, I see all these. These are all software licenses. Yeah. Okay. I guess I will get the uh, non OEM. I would just get like the Intel standard um, driver. Um, I forgot mm -hmm. what what um, Wi Fi card did I order? I think it was AX201 or something similar. Uh, okay, I also don't oh, have man. right click on my keyboard. Oh, I, I mean, on, on my touchpad. Um, so I guess I'll do that. Oh man, uh, I actually opened some of the files on that. Okay. And uh, and and it and it and I opened it, and it has it's a document, it's a docx file, and it has someone's comments, and it, and it and someone and it's like a comment, and it's like one of the few. All the fields are empty. It's like a form. And like someone called Joanne Yang <laughs> says, this is the exhibit of the license. And I think it can illustrate the legal notice that users may need to be cautious. <laughs> so these are uh, framework employees working on those documents. That's kind of interesting. <laughs> this is a... Uh... <laughs> yeah, this is a... Uh... You know, it's uh, this is an interesting. Uh, Intel's Wi-Fi drivers are universal to all of their different SKUs, right? I think they're the same. Yeah. There's some pretty interesting uh, uh, licenses in here. <laughs> <laughs> There's uh there's literal uh oh uh there there's code from the hacker's delight algorithm code. Oh interesting. So I still don't have uh brightness control, so I guess that'll come later with more drivers. So where would you get the where would you get the drivers? Oops. Uh, ProSet wireless tools. Um, so where would you get the drivers? Like the display. Um, Windows yeah. update, I presume. Oh, interesting. Okay. Um, wireless LAN driver. Wireless Bluetooth. I don't think that's the one I want. Uh, I guess I'll try rebooting. Or actually, let me try... Uh, so we have Intel Wireless Bluetooth. Okay, so that was just the Bluetooth driver. The Wi-Fi driver is separate. Um, Larry, you ever use the uh, ProSet wireless driver for IT admins? Use that one? I don't usually use that one. I think usually... See, here's the thing. I've never actually had to install the... I think I had to do that for one of the MateBook X Pro generations. Uh, before a Windows update ended up including it later. Huh. Whoops. Okay. So overall, you know, the setup experience has not been too bad. It's just a minor hiccup with the Wi-Fi driver. Uh, I, I think it's forgivable. Um, it's more of a operating system issue than anything else.
Um, so, you know, right now we've gotten a pretty much fully functional OS within not too much time, um, considering how much time we spent looking over the internals. Um, to continue my little rant about connected standby, so I, you know, it, I noticed that the external monitor and the internal display were both fully lit, backlight, image, everything, uh, when the computer was, quote, sleeping, unquote. And so I just thought, oh dear, with all the computers in this office and many other offices around the world, Intel has just tremendously increased their carbon footprint by introducing connected standby. You know what I mean? Oh yeah. I mean, like all those displays are on. Is... The computer does not actually sleep. You have to hibernate, uh, but that's not convenient because you know it takes a long time to wake from hibernation. I think this is a bug. I honestly think this is a bug, and uh, honestly, the the idea behind connected standby is not terrible. The idea behind connected standby is modern processors can idle at something like a hundred milliwatts. Mm -hmm. um, without going to sleep mode. So in theory, there's no need to actually put the computer into sleep. Now, of course, this relies on the power management working for all the other components of the system. So under ideal circumstances, the computer would actually be pulling 10th of a watt and you wouldn't have a problem. But I think the problem is that power management is really bad. Um, on many OEM devices and drivers. So, oh, it looks like you have uh, a lot of drivers to install. Yep. I mean, I'm yeah, hoping that once I install the Wi Fi driver, the rest of them, um, you know, come with that. Um, okay, so, in, oh, okay, so the framework laptop driver bundle. There we go. So, okay. So, uh, I would like to put up this uh, framework laptop install guide. So, they have an install guide, which is really nice. Um, Windows 10 installation on the framework laptop DIY edition. So, I'm going to, oops, put that on the screen so that I can read it and you guys can see what I'm talking about as well. Uh-huh. Window capture. Yep. All right. This is what I'm talking about. So I mean this is this is really nice. Like this is Yeah, it it, it says you need to download the the driver bundle. So that's exactly what I'm doing now. Actually, uh Something I'm sort of wondering, uh, does does Windows actually show their OEM product ID? Uh, show their what ID? Oh, wow. This is a huge driver bundle. This is close to 800 megabytes. That's the same as what Surface does. does. Okay. Yeah, so, you know, I think Connect to Standby is... Like you say, it's it's good in theory. It's it's coming from the right place, but the execution is just so so bad. Uh, it's just so atrociously executed that um, it is ruining, in many ways, Intel laptops right now. And it's, I mean, regardless of what the intent was or what the ideal effect would have been, the effect that it's having in reality right now is it is significantly increasing the carbon footprint of all Windows laptops. Um, and, you know, if you're not someone that cares about that in particular, fine. Uh, what about the fact that, what if you want to put the computer to sleep when you go to sleep 
and now the backlight is on on your monitor and it's lighting up your room and you can't go to sleep. Right? That's, that's an annoyance. That's a big user experience deficit that Intel has just introduced to all of Intel laptops just like that. I mean, it's just, it's absolutely terrible. And you can't even get rid of that behavior on uh, the current generation, at least most, at least all of the ones that I know. You can't get rid of that behavior. It's locked down. S3 sleep is not available. I'm trying to find out uh, what that uh, command is that you can to get uh, Windows the Windows product ID like how it uh, how it identifies uh, how it uh, identifies your uh, OEM system okay because that actually might uh, tell us whether when will actually uh... oh you know what we're gonna okay I'm so happy about this I'm so happy I got the HDMI uh, expansion card because now that we are done with at least for now with the hardware uh, and we're you know tinkering with the, the software now I can switch out the uh, cam link from my camera to the HDMI module oh right. yeah so I can stream the uh, laptop without even installing OBS on it oh yeah that's uh... convenient right so I'm gonna do a live swap. Um, because it's USB based, it's basically like USB dongles, but built into the computer. So it's live swappable, just like a cable. Okay, so we got the HDMI port in. Sorry, I had to do it off camera because of ergonomics issues. Um, let's plug in the HDMI cord. Let's see if we get that on the, the stream now. Um, let's see, it's installing the Intel graphics driver. I wonder if that has anything to do with uh, the fact that the HDMI is currently not displaying yet. Um, I don't have a right click, that's kind of annoying. Oh. Right click is now here. So that just changed. Um, display settings. Yeah, so we're not seeing the external display. Uh, at least the laptop is not seeing it right now. Yeah, so the display resolution is 2256 by 1504. It's lower than the MateBook X Pro's 3000 by 2000 um, by quite a bit, but this is still within the optimal range. I really do think it's the, it's still within the Goldilocks uh, DPI range. By the way, uh, so two things. First of all, the screen looks like it's black. I don't know if that. Yeah. Um, As I was saying, you know, the, uh, uh, the computer is not recognizing the HDMI output yet. So uh, somebody's uh, somebody's mentioned. Uh, T Quick asks, "Is the bundle an executable or?" drivers in a compressed board. It's a uh, executable. Okay. Yeah, it's a single exe file. Um, I haven't tried, I don't have the uh, exe extraction tools on this computer, uh, but it is a humongous 800 megabyte exe. And, um, okay. How uh, and uh, and the uh, someone's asking how, how does the quality feel compared to the Pro? Uh, how does the quality feel compared to the MateBook X Pro? Um, yeah, it is definitely at least one or two tiers below the MateBook X Pro. Um, to date, the MateBook X Pro series, as far as external design and build quality, uh, I would say it's tier one. 
Uh, I'm just making these tiers up, but I would say this oh, okay. is tier one along with MacBooks. Oh, okay. Uh, along with MacBooks so, and perhaps Surface So you products. would say, so you'd say, uh, yeah. This is tier three. It's a... Uh... So like the um, IdeaPad series, I, a lot of them are, I would say tier two. Same thing with the Spectre X360 14. It does feel cheaper than the MateBook X Pro. I would consider those tier two, and those are still perfectly acceptable. Um, this is tier three. This is noticeably less premium than even the X360 14. I would say this is, um, as far as feel goes, this is like, this feels like a hmm, six to $700 laptop. So the, so actually this one looks a in a way, I think. This looks what? It, it, it almost feels like an idea pad kind of. It, yeah. It feels like an idea pad. I, I don't know why. Exactly. It's, That's it's what I thought Spiritually, well. it feels like an idea pad. Yep. Okay. So let me try to reconnect the HDMI, see if it changes anything. Try to get an HDMI image to happen. Okay, so I'm mirroring the display. I guess I should um, reconnect my cam link. Okay, so, uh, well, the aspect ratio is three by two, but, um, there we go. We've got display. Larry, you will see it in a few seconds. Yes, I see it now. Cool. Uh, your video is covering. So. Yeah, I'm. Uh, let me move the display to the left, actually. Uh, let's see. Can we do that? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Now I'm covering it less. How about that? Yes, that's working. All right. So let me just go and check that all the drivers are in. Can you actually go to uh, open a command prompt and type system info in it? It might have to be an administrator. Uh, are you just looking for uh, system information? No, uh, just, yeah, this it's, one? it's uh, no, I think, uh, no, I think you're, I think it's like the, uh, just, yeah. System info. System info with no, no I've never not, executed not, this uh, command. Uh, oh, oh, system info. Okay. okay. What are you looking for, Larry? Uh, just, have a, just, just to see if it has a, oh, yeah, I think. So this uh, Wi-Fi card is the Intel AX210. Uh, which is Wi-Fi 6E instead of Wi-Fi 6. Well, rather, in addition to Wi-Fi 6. So this has the 6 gigahertz Oh, let's band. just try, try that other window with the other window. Yeah, what, what are you actually product. looking for? I'm looking for, like, that, uh, that product string. I, I didn't get a screenshot of it yet. Product string? But uh, there's, a, there's a product string. Just uh, if you put that on the screen... Uh, I think it's this one, the system SKUs. Uh... Oh, this one? Yeah. Okay. Um, I want to screen share. What, what do you do with that? So basically the idea is if some someone said online that shipping retail Windows licenses with these machines, uh, which would mean that they they're that they haven't registered the machine as like an OEM machine with Microsoft. So, so the thing is when, when you register machines with Microsoft, uh, what, what you can do is you can put a set of drivers into Windows Update. Mm. So when Windows Update sees, oh, you're on a framework laptop, mm. it knows how to just download every single customized driver from the OEM yes. for you so you don't have to install anything manually. So some people were saying that framework didn't do that. Uh, right. And that's why you have to do it manually. Mm -hmm. But 
I'm not sure. Uh, I'll check with the people that uh, were discussing this. Uh, I think that makes sense. Yeah, I've seen lap laptops that do that. Um, for example, uh, the Lenovo's I've had, I've never had to use, you know, any kind of OEM website download um, to um, get the drivers. I would just run Windows Update. Same thing with the Matebooks, although often Huawei PC Manager will have newer drivers. Okay, so let's see. I want to start with Crystal Disk Mark. Um, because I want to just make sure that PCIe 4 is working for the 980 Pro SSD. Crystal disk mark. Oh God. Life is hard without an ad blocker. <laughs> Oh wow, that's a lot of ads. Okay, um, what else do we want? We want, uh, I wanna do a stress test with, um, let's do Ida64. I'm just gonna copy over Ida64 here. I already have it. Um, okay. I want a quick CPU or uh, maybe uh Throttle stop. HW info. HW info might be useful. Yep. HW info. You got it. Oh, how about Prime 95? That's always a classic. Yeah, we can get that. Yeah. Prime 95. And Furmark. I like to run Prime 95 oh, plus Furmark. Fur oh, yeah. Furmark. All right, uh, Crystal Disk Info is ready first, so we'll go with that. So, whoops, uh, uh, did I actually did download? No, I, I meant to download Crystal Disk Mark, my bad. I accidentally downloaded Crystal Disk Info. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we can try that. Okay, Crystal Disk Info. I mean, Crystal Disk Mark. It's an installer. That's that's slightly annoying. It really doesn't there have to be. There are a lot of ads. Yeah. There are a lot of ads. <laughs> it's like, the whoa, this is a whole it. whole different thing, you know, like finally looking at the internet without an ad blocker. It's, it feels so different. Um, There's like an ad for a Razer book. <laughs> profile. Real world performance plus mix I'll just do real world performance okay let's let's go for it I'll just do like three I just want to see the throughput um, just I just want to see you know the five gigabytes per second or so speed so it's 3.3 .3 gigabytes per second right now that does not seem like was it uh, what was the speed of the uh, PCIe 4 SSDs. Isn't it like six or seven gigabytes per second? Yeah, like at least four or five. Yeah. That's... We're not getting PCIe 4 speeds up here. I mean, these are good speeds, but they're not PCIe 4 speeds. I wonder if like some kind of uh, driver is required to achieve it. Did you install the uh, driver pack? Yeah, I did. This is the first reboot after that. Um, I guess I'll check Windows Update again. Wait, how did we get so high? Okay, looks oh, like yeah. my copying has finished. Oh, we have more drivers, but these are just not. These are not device drivers. These are updates, not drivers at all. Huh. Driver updates Intel Net. Yeah, I'm gonna try disk drives. Hey, how do you? I guess HW Info might show it. Okay, let me plug this in here. 
I'm already digging the uh, swappable modules for IO. But I guess if, if, you're, if you've got something like the um, MacRevo F1, which has an HDMI, full-size SD card slot, two USB-Cs, two USB-As, I mean Thunderbolts and USB-As, um, you really have all of them at once. So you're not missing anything relative to what the framework laptop, uh, laptop offers. I feel like the framework laptop is a better hardware build quality than the Mac Revo. Yeah, I've I've uh, read some concerning reviews on that, where uh, using multiple USB devices will cause instability. Um, but uh, I had a friend test it out for me, and so far he hasn't seen those issues. Hmm. I'm not. I'm not sure if it is the. Uh, well, I'm mostly looking at a picture of the Adata XPG Xenia. Mm -hmm. Is that uh, sold in North America? It? Is that sold in uh, U.S. and Canada? Adata, so probably yes. Okay. Because uh, I, I I'm mean, having I, uh, my friend bring it over from China, like the OG um, Tsinghua Tongfang version, non okay. non rebrand. Cool. Cool. So, uh, I mean, cooling-wise, it looks like it's actually got less than the framework. Really? This is the 14-inch one, right? Mm-hmm. It's dual Yeah, fan, uh, right? did you get the GPU? Did you get the GPU one? No. Non-GPU, right? Right. So then you only get one fan, one heat pipe. Hmm. Okay. And... It is a smaller, uh, well, actually it has space for a second fan and whatnot, but it has an, a space for a second fan and a GPU. Does it have the for connector a for a second fan? Because I actually see the fan on Amazon. But I don't know about the heat sink though, because the heat pipe, yeah, the heat pipe's not there. So that's, hmm. I would have to buy the heat sink assembly and I don't see that right now on Amazon. Oh, yeah. Okay, so, uh, oh, did I run it in sensor-only mode? I I wanted to get the uh, actual, the entire thing. Okay, so, yeah, right now it doesn't look like we're getting PCIe 4 speed, so let's investigate that first. Um, okay, so, what do we have here? So, okay, so it shows TDP as 28 watts, nice. I don't think... 1185D7 comes in less than 28 watts, unless the OEM is so, pulling something uh, really ridiculous. Some somebody uh, somebody Brendan wants to know uh, if you can use CPUZ or something to see if you're getting the good RAM RAM timings. He says, oh. uh, "Isn't Crucial Ballistics 1.35 volts? Didn't think it would be compatible." Hmm. Uh, so the Timing right now is 16, 16, 16, 16, I mean, 16, 16, 16, 35. I think that's the timing, the best timing of the module. Um, but the memory clock is concerning right now. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> there um, it is. You're only running 266. Uh, We'll go into the BIOS and see if there's anything to change there. Uh, what happened there? Just that was a Windows update or something. Um, okay, let's let's quickly restart and go into the BIOS to sort that out. Uh, framework, Larry, do you know the um, keyboard shortcut to go into BIOS setup? They're using inside, so it's probably F2, delete, okay. or delete. All right, so before we get deeper into the performance evaluation uh, on this live stream, let's talk a little bit about what's going on with Intel laptops nowadays uh, with how they're regulating performance. So um, if you haven't been informed about this before, 
there's quite a few different throttling schemes. Now, throttling is, is um, basically anything that the system does to lower the performance of the processor in order to either extend battery life or reduce heat. Um, so it'll run the CPU at a lower frequency than it could, um, than it can, in order to achieve either of those goals. And traditionally, uh, the first throttling scheme that was introduced was probably thermal throttling. Um, that's basically when your CPU reaches 100 degrees, your um, CPU will kind of bounce its frequency down uh, to keep it at around 100 degrees, but no more than 100 degrees. Uh, different OEMs can set a different offset to let it throttle, let's say, at 93 degrees or whatever. Uh, in the 2020 MXP, for example, that was 91 degrees, if I recall correctly. So that's thermal throttling. And that makes a lot of sense. You know, you never want your CPU to go over the rated maximum temperature. Now, in recent years, uh, power throttling was introduced. And this is one that I either don't understand or just don't agree with, uh, with his philosophy. And uh, the reason I say that is it arbitrarily defines a limit of, of TDP that the CPU can achieve or is allowed to achieve despite the chip actually being able to deliver more. And um, I don't know if, if Intel's doing this to increase product differentiation between the U-series processors and the H-series processors and the desktop processors, um, or as, as a means to extend battery life or enhance user experience by lowering surface temperatures, etc. But it seems to be a very roundabout way to achieve any of those goals. Um, so you have this arbitrarily defined power limit where your CPU is uh, able to go to a certain level of power for let's say 28 seconds or whatever the timeout may be, and it'll lower itself down to a lower power limit after that and stay there. And this will happen independently of what temperature the CPU is at. Even if the CPU is at, let's say 60 or 70 degrees, which is really not that concerning of a temperature, it'll still throttle itself down to those power targets. Um, and this effectively is a great differentiator between, let's say, the i7 10510U quad core up to 4.6 gigahertz all core boost or something like that, which is pretty crazy in this 2020 MateBook X Pro versus something like the desktop 7700K CPU, which actually has similar clock speeds uh, produced on the same 14 nan similar 14 nanometer process uh, and the same core count. And this processor running full uh, full power, which I've achieved 80 watts by removing power limits, uh, can approach the performance of a 7700K. But, of course, uh, due to firmware or software driver limitations, these chips in these laptops are never allowed to run that high, even if uh, the thermal uh, solution is adequate. So, um, that's another uh, industry direction that I don't quite understand or agree with. Um, and so that's something that I'm also interested in checking out on the framework laptop. How restrictive is the power limit? So Larry has told me that this will do uh, 60 watts, right, Larry? Um, so for, so for the, the website boost? actually claims, it, it claims it'll do 60 watts on and claim it'll do 20, 28 watts long-term. Right. Now, uh, Notebook Check actually ran some tests. It mm -hmm. does not do 60 watts. Okay, all right. So, so we'll we'll, we'll check this out um, when this finishes rebooting. Um, so, so one of the reasons they actually do the power limit thing is it's sort of a it's a roundabout way to basically implement basically the, the problem with running it based on I think like well you have a point about the temperature, but I think the power is very convenient way to. Uh, manage how exactly your processor is going to behave in a thermal management. System. As we know, you know, yes. with with basically anything else, you know, with temperature alone, temperature isn't really um, 
temperature isn't everything because you can't tell if that's that high temperature is simply because the fan's not on or you know if some other situation is mm -hmm. at play it's you know with power it's a really good way to implement controls it's general. a more um, predictive model yeah in in you know in laptops there's not that many sensors so right you're mostly working with a feed forward not a feedback system mm -hmm. so when when you put all those together it, it seems like power is a very convenient way to fix problems with the you know the cpu bouncing off 99 degrees or you know yeah. and throttling even worse or it fixes problems with say uh it fixes problems with say you know the bottom case having a 60 degree hot spot or something that's sort of that's sort of like the I think so that's kind of like the you're rationale. calling it a band-aid fix to uh, thermal engineering um, deficiencies it's it's basically because everyone's banking on the fact that nobody opts for serious computation nowadays and they're trying to put processors that consume too much power for the system. In the past, the reason why we didn't do it was because simply, you know, a 35 watt processor, you had to dissipate 35 watts or else, you know, or else, you know, that computer is not going to work. Mm -hmm. The But nowadays, you know, they, um, they underbuild the thermal system and plus CPU power consumption has gone way up. Uh, Intel doesn't want to advertise the fact that their processors can run faster because that looks terrible because now your mobile processor takes more power than it should. Uh, so I think there's like a bunch of factors that went into making it work this way. Um, okay. And it turns out the power limitation was the easiest way to do it. Uh, the other great thing about limiting power as a, to uh, simply frequency or simply temperature is that with power, the CPU can sort of decide how to spend that power, and it can be balanced across components and whatnot. So, I guess there are, that's sort of like the main reason behind it. And of course, also just to handle the fact that, yeah. Well, I see you're in the setup. But, uh... Yeah. Well, you know, I I I, I don't know. I I I guess I I know what you're saying. Like. I think those are valid considerations, like, uh, but the... they don't uh, outweigh. Would you be able to move the uh, screen position a little bit? And see. Uh, the yeah, it actually folds completely flat. Yeah, you want you want to just uh, go ahead and do that and just uh, click through. Yep. Pages quickly. Yep. Okay, so there's not that much. Uh, there's actually uh, not a lot of stuff to change in here. There's no, no RAM settings, no, you know, what's, what are they called? XMP to, profiles. Yeah, let's go to advanced CPU. Huh. There are more settings than, uh, than normal. Yeah. Wait. Yeah. What the hell is a flex ratio? Huh. Man, this thing, this really smells like a Lenovo. Oh my God. Especially when it heats up, it smells exactly like a Lenovo. Oh. <laughs> uh, yeah, we don't have any RAM settings. I guess I bought the wrong RAM. What does battery disconnect? Uh, oh, so this, um, this was uh, just, like disconnect the battery. So if you are, you know, running the laptop off of AC um, off the oh, wall right. for like a long time, you can just let the battery sit there instead of, you know, uh, damaging the battery. Oh, I see. But no battery limit. Uh, right. I mean, that might be implemented somewhere else that I'm not aware of right now. Yeah, I think they said it was 
coming soon. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, other than that, you know, there's... You can disable some devices here. Um, pretty standard inside BIOS, actually. Secure boot. Um, yeah, anything else you wanted to see? Uh, that's that's about it. Is it? Wait, let me see the... Uh, oh, it has a TP. Wait, let's see what it says in Secure Boot. You want to see the Secure Boot oh. settings? Yeah. There's a bunch of these things. Keck options. That's funny. I think, uh, I think it's a uh, video hasn't gotten... Oh, okay. I, I have no idea what these mean. I've never messed with okay. Secure Boot before. Okay, it has yeah. uh, Laptop Keck. Yeah. <laughs> Microsoft Corporation Keck. All right, um, uh, nothing to change there actually. So we'll go right yeah. back to the OS. Huh. So it has more settings than normal. Yes. Than the average Without... laptop, yeah. Okay, well, that's a... Uh... So, I will bring the HDMI cable back to the framework and we'll do some stress tests. See how much heat this can handle. Now, uh, I believe the ambient temperature in the room is about 27 degrees, 25. Okay. We're at room temp temp. Let's run some st stress tests. Have you... Uh, I think I need to refresh you, uh... The, uh, the capture device. Have you heard of the that uh that TV show thing? There's, I think there's a TV show episode of the Dope Community where of they the talk what about community? a room. No, it's it, I think it's literally called Community, and like there's an episode like called like the Room Temperature Room or something. Yes, yes. There's a clip of it. On, uh, is that from Key and Peele? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Okay, so I'm gonna load up, um, let's say Prime 95. I'm gonna do a CPU only stress test first. I'm also gonna load up HW Info to monitor the CPU while it's doing that. Okay, so uh, back to your touchpad question, Larry. It feels pretty good. There's no wobble. Uh, like there's no pre-travel before the click um, on any location on the touchpad. The touchpad itself seems to be glass, or at least it seems, you know, very similar in terms of surface texture as uh, my ancient 2011 MacBook Pro 13 inch, which is a good thing. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to start the small FFT test in Prime 95. So uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with Prime 95, it's one of the most, it's one of the heaviest stress tests that you can run on your computer, at least pertaining to the CPU. It tends to cause your CPU to use the most power. And uh, I saw the power go up to 57 watts as recorded on this maximum column, and now it's down to 35 watts. That's total system power. Oh, did I look, look at the wrong line? I did. Uh, look at the, uh, CPU the package power went up to 30 watts, and now it's back down to 15 watts. Oh gosh, that's disappointing. That's bad. Why is it, why is it on, why is it 15? Uh, it wait, hold PL1, on. PL3. Maybe, how about that? Uh, does that change anything? Okay, that changed it. Okay, cool. So that's actually a huge um, 
difference between a best performance battery profile and better performance battery profile. So I'm gonna stop the uh, Prime 95. And I'm gonna let the CPU sort of settle back down. And now that we're in the correct power mode, we're gonna start running this test once again to, to see if it shoots up to a higher package power. <laughs> I was reading the wrong line. Uh, this is what happens when I try to talk and do a stress test at the same time. Um, so, torture test, small FFTs. All right, eyes on the CPU package power. Let's see. Okay, 30 watts, 44 watts, 49 watts. Okay, and it's coming back down. So it's, okay, so it's thermal throttling. 100 degrees. Okay, so right now the thermal throttling is actually controlling the CPU. And now it's no longer controlling the CPU. Now we're back down to uh, power throttling. Uh, and that is confirmed by this right here, power limit exceeded. And also, uh, where is the performance is, limit is reasons? The fan running on full? Yeah, I think so. Um, I wonder if we have fan monitoring uh, enabled here. I don't think we are able to monitor the fan speed on this thing. Huh. But it sounds like it's reached maximum speed and staying there. So currently we're at 82 mm -hmm. degrees and bouncing a little bit, 82, 88, 84, and the package power has stabilized to 28 watts. So that is... Um, Limit reasons, yeah, performance limit reasons. Let's see what's going on here. This is um, PL1 throttling. Yeah, the classic PL1 throttling. So PL1 is the long-term power limit and PL2 is the short-term power limit. And tau is uh, the number of seconds or milliseconds um, that your CPU is allowed to run at PL2 before it goes down to PL1. So that's why we saw the power limit, uh, the, rather the CPU power, shoot up to 57 watts or so, and then come back down after half a minute to now 28 watts and staying there. Okay. So next, um, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to, um, copy over my alpha build sent to me by Uncle Webb. Um, he sent me a alpha build of throttle stop that seems to be compatible with Tiger Lake now. I'm working with him on, uh, well, it's, I mean, he's doing all the work obviously, <laughs> but I sent him some clues on, uh, on getting that compatible. So I'm gonna copy that over and uh, try to unlock that power limit. Because again, as, as much as power limits, power limits may make sense from a design standpoint um, in terms of simplifying the controls or whatever um, and having more control over the predictability of the CPU behavior and the overall system behavior, um, I fundamentally don't agree, at least on my computers, with power limits. I prefer to let my CPUs run as hot as they can, uh, which is 100 degrees typically, because that maximizes performance. So I'm going to load up throttle stop.
Okay. So let's see. Mm, let's go for like I don't know, forty watts PL one and eighty watts PL two. Oh, that's interesting because. Hmm. Oh, these are previous values because I copied over the. Um, I and I file as well, so. Oh. So these are not like the default values of the framework actually. Uh, instead the default is, well it changes, you know, like you've got DPTF in here. Like uh, this laptop I believe does have DPTF and that's why we saw the power limits change uh, from 60 and 28 to 30 and 15. And uh, just to confirm, yep, so it has the Intel dynamic tuning drivers So I'm gonna apply this, um, and in real time it should change. Let's see. Yep, okay, so now um, if we look at, where was it? Here, the uh, performance limit reasons. PL1 is still limiting, PL2, PL3, interesting. But we are able to stabilize it to 95C, which is really good. And here, you know, it's like, to me, the, the hotter the CPU is running, Keteris Paribus, the happier I am, actually, because I know that no arbitrary limit is being enforced. I know that the system itself isn't changing. It's not like the cooling system is getting worse or anything, but as Larry mentioned before, uh, power and temperature are, really, uh, are uh, positively correlated so 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 what's interesting here same check sort of discovered um you'll notice that your cpu is around 31 point and we're at 96 mm -hmm. um, so i think i noted that 32 watts is realistically what this cooling system is going to do for the cpu yeah uh, so with a pl1 of 28 watts the framework uh, framework hasn't really really limited it that badly right yeah they they really only took three watts off your performance yes and if your ambient temperature gets any higher you know they probably aren't taking any of your yeah i just think that in principle it should be based on the temperature because what if i bring this laptop to a very cold environment uh, i would love to enjoy the bonus performance that it uh, can potentially give me. So I guess, yeah, I think one of the problems, it's just like the way they design the systems, you know. I just, I just feel like the controls have been made more arbitrary and less reflective of what the actual physical limitations are. And they're, oh, yeah, thereby wasting sure. performance along the way. Yeah, for sure. Um, hey, you wanna you wanna uh, add in uh, Furmark now? So we should sure. expect to see actually more package power once we add in Furmark because right now we're stressing pretty much everything in the CPU die except for the integrated graphics. So now if I just run like a relatively high resolution Furmark, doesn't have to be too crazy because um, I mean it, it'll. I don't think there's much difference because if, if you turn down the resolution, it'll just do more, uh, oops, it'll just do more FPSs. So, okay, so here's Furmark. And as expected, the package power has increased to about 35 watts, as opposed to what, 32 before? Now we're at 36, 36.5. I remember a long time ago, I used to be able to get 42 watts on the uh, MacBook Pro uh, if I had uh, if I had uh, both Firmark and Prime 95 going. 
Okay. And that was at like 99C. It was hitting pretty high. Yeah. Okay, cool. So I think that's all we needed to know as far as thermal and power behavior. Yeah, the other side the other side of power behavior is how low can the power Wouldn't you wouldn't you, wouldn't you think that's an that's another avenue to explore? Sure, but I don't know like I I feel like that varies so much based on the software configuration. Well, mo more, mostly I was saying like just if you idle it completely and set the screen brightness to like pretty low okay how and much power so is the you, whole you wanna thing you wanna see the uh the system was it total system power well i think uh i think i don't know how that's measured i think you might want to actually see if the see if it corresponds to the battery oh uh Go the down. uh charge rate the negative charge rate yeah 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 uh, so let's see here what else is running here uh i guess it's just hw info now um, I'm going to unplug all of the external devices. Uh, that will disable the. Uh, that will disable the. Uh... Yeah, let, let's let's test this another time. I don't think it's that interesting of a test, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry to disappoint. But it Larry. does. It does. It it does actually. Uh, it is quite important because is, a few yeah. watts of change. That's exactly can like the. Make the difference uh, between... That's the most important metric in battery life. It's like idle power. Yeah. Which is why I sort of suggested it. I agree, it's kind of boring to test. You know, I kind of don't want to unplug my HDMI port and reset my Yeah, I, I figured that. Uh, yeah. yeah, I figured that problem was... Uh... Okay. Um, can, do you have any pointers as to uh, why I'm not getting PCIe 4 speeds on the SSD? So, PCI... So the way PCI... It, it tries its best to negotiate uh, the fastest speed possible, but if the quality of the link is insufficient, it falls back. Okay. Now, this is not to say that there there could be still firmware preventing it from negotiating that hmm. that speed. Yeah. I'm not totally certain what what exactly is causing. It. Right. Okay. I just do know that it can be hard to troubleshoot PCIe. For... Yeah, it's not an exactly transparent uh, protocol. No, but it, it's also uh, pretty. It can be finicky. Hmm. I want to take another look at this uh, bezel here. So the bezels are are easily interchangeable. Um, Does it come with another one? Uh, you could have, I could have ordered another one, but I didn't. Um, Do we have many um, options currently? Or? They have like a white bezel, I think. Uh, what I'm really interested in though is a touchscreen option because I don't know if I'm going to be fully happy with this laptop without a touchscreen. Although I think there's a reason and that's just because they want that magnetic attach. Uh, oh, um, if it was touchscreen, it would. And if it was a touchscreen, yeah. they would have to mount it. Yes. That's How would they do that? Hmm. How would do you, you think there it? there is an upgrade path for touchscreen? Because I mean, maybe they could uh, have the whole thing mount and then have like a little, like plastic trim piece that you like that clips in. Uh, and then you just like pry it out to access a screw for mounting instead of like that the entire work. bezel that coming off. Work. That could work, but I think like th there's also like a thickness sort of consideration. So right now the screen is uh, recessed within the bezel by about one millimeter. So I wasn't saying that kind of thickness thing, like when you have to overlay a bezel onto something that's thicker yeah so it, w it wouldn't it would have to be a bezel less kind of i mean not bezel less but you know like glass from 
I've never seen a touchscreen that's not glass from end to end. So here's the thing. Um, there is sort of like a bottom, you know, you know how there's like a bezel, there's like a chin, right? Mm -hmm. uh, one thing they could do is not have the chin covered and, you know, right. just have the chin stay a, like a removable strip and then have screws under it. Right. But you would still need a way to mount it on top. So at the very least, they would have to ship you a top upper uh, case assembly yeah. if they wanted to provide that. So it's not a part. it's not a direct or straight super straightforward you know for free upgrade path. There's you you more would have to have required. yeah there, there's it's it's an it's engineering required and you know. What do people think when they hear that? <laughs> yeah. You know, engineering required, which means it might be too expensive, have pitfalls. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to move myself back in here. All right. So uh, I guess we can run your idle power test now, Larry. Okay. Yeah. Um, actually, uh, I might have messed up the CPU config. Um, I'll restart. I'll get rid oh, of Oh, you the, mean uh, like, oh, you mean the throttle stop stuff? Yeah. So I guess I'll I just mean, exit it, it and then it'll, I'll just do a reboot. Because um, I might have changed the speed shift settings, etc. Oh, okay. I see. Um, Okay, so while this is restarting, I'll just make my last comments on this laptop overall. You know, first impressions, one hour review, that kind of thing. Um, we didn't test the speakers. <laughs> oh, you're right. I didn't. Okay, so I guess we'll find some uh, royalty-free music to, to test after we do your battery test, and that'll be our outro music. <laughs> um, yeah. So, so far, everything except the speakers we've, we've tested. I guess we haven't tested the uh, fingerprint reader. Um, we have not mm, tested the... Fun. There's a bunch of other things that we can test, of course. But um, overall, would I daily drive this laptop? No. I don't think so. I think there's better options out there. Um, I think that... I mean, there are things that this laptop does that no other laptop can do, and that is pretty much meeting all of your requirements uh, based on your customization. For example, what do I need? Well, I need to edit videos on my laptop, which actually happens to be my only computer. Like whatever laptop I'm daily driving at the moment, that's the only computer I use. I do not have a separate desktop. so. I need the laptop to be very performant. And that's something that might not apply to every other laptop user out there. So I need a lot of RAM. Um, the MateBook X Pro has 16 gigs, up to 16 gigs. The Spectre X360 14, up to 16 gigs. All these 16 gig Ultrabooks no longer meet my needs. When I fire up Premiere Pro and edit a 4K 60 FPS video, fills up all of those 16 gigs right away. So I need at least 32. This framework laptop provides that. Um, what else do I need? I need uh, ports. So it's a, it, in 2021, it's still a huge inconvenience in my opinion uh, to not have USB-A ports. There's too many devices that are just still USB-A. Um, so that rules out the XPS 13, for example. So this laptop, again, provides that. You can shove in as many USB-A's as you want, whatever, you know, any combination of four ports, um, including the micro SD card slot, which is very convenient for loading my files onto my 3D printer. Um, so I do like those. Um, the screen is great. It's very usable, but it's not touchscreen. I might be able to live with that, but I haven't actually tested. Uh, you know, it's been a good while since I've used a non-touch laptop. I think the last time was 2013. So that's a big minus. And then most of all, I think, is the keyboard. Like if this laptop looked like this, but it felt great 
on its keyboard, I would have been fine with it. Um, but the keyboard is just too mushy. And I type a lot and I enjoy typing. At least I want to enjoy typing on a good keyboard. And this isn't it. I mean, this is, it's got the key travel, but it's, it's mushy. It's not the worst. I think you could live with it, but I would prefer not to because there are better options. So with that said, um, your mileage may vary. Uh, you know, you might like this keyboard. Different people have different preferences. If, I mean, if you're a fan of, I don't know, I guess you would call this, uh, I feel like it's like uh, the Cherry MX Brown of laptop keyboards. It's like, ta it's going for tactile. It's got the key travel, but it's kind of mushy. Uh, so anyway, we have the laptop booted back up. So I will run Larry's battery life test. Um, we'll put it in better battery. We'll take the brightness all the way down. And uh, oh, that is very dim. Larry, still there? Yep. All right, here's your test. So uh, I guess I'll just read it out to you because you can't even see what's on the screen anymore. Um, and then now I will unplug the charger. Mind you, this is running HW Info, which in itself requires some power because it refreshes every two seconds. Um, and then I will also look at Um, I will look at the CPU frequency to make sure that it is in fact uh, scaling itself down uh, due to no load. Uh, average effective clock is in the double digits, so seems good there. All right. Um, this is... So current charge rate is negative 7.5 watts idling. That's, negative uh, 7 .2. that's that's significant actually. That's uh that's a little on the high side. Yeah. What don't you think? Yeah, and average effective clock right now. Uh, by the way, the uh, is the keyboard backlit? I can't tell. I don't. Oh, it is. It is. Um, it's FN plus space, just like in the Lenovo. Uh, and is the backlight on? The room is so bright, I can't even tell. Uh, oh, there we go. Okay, so the backlight is off. Uh, screen brightness is all the way down. I don't think there's anything else. I've also turned off the Wi-Fi. And uh, right now the, uh, the average effective clock is at 12 megahertz, 10 megahertz. So the CPU is pretty much sleeping. And our discharge rate is negative uh, 5.7 watts, stable, 5.6, yeah. So idle drain is about 5.6 watts, which is, I guess, not too far That's off normal. significant. Yeah, That's it's, significant. it's on the high side. It's not like orders That's of magnitude. More. Yeah, it is definitely, yeah. I think the MateBook X Pro was like 4.5, but that's according to, I haven't tested that on the MateBook, um, you know, in, in any kind of uh, strict manner. That was just notebook checks test, and uh, I might be doing something completely different here. Yeah. So, does that give you the information you needed, Larry? Yes. Uh, that's kind of an interesting, that's an interesting discovery. Yeah, I don't think, I mean, uh, I think it's actually kind of similar to the uh, MateBook X Pro. So at this rate, so what this means is it'll idle for about 10 hours and then the battery's dead. Which is not even that bad, but... It's normal. <laughs> it's like normal. Drop, it's normal for a Windows laptop. If they dropped it to half a watt. Or no, if they dropped it to <laughs> half that. Two, you want it, you want it to, to idle like uh, you want it to sit power like a MacBook. Well, if it if if they were able to drop it down to two and a half, mm -hmm. uh, this would run for twenty hours. 
which means if you cut that in half, that's 10 hours of real world use. Yeah, so with the brightness to like 30% now, uh, the drain is minus 6.7. So what you have to remember is the, the idle power is in addition to any power that you consume while using the computer. Yes. That's like base. So, yeah. So, so that's going to, so you're hurting for battery life as long as the computer's on to a certain degree. Even you know, the, uh, the fingerprint LED is pretty bright. The, the, there, there's this uh, ring around the fingerprint reader and it's constantly on. <laughs> I mean, every, every little milliwatt counts, right? That's not where the power is going. Actually. Yeah, it's not. Power is probably but to like I don't the know, power is on going. the motherboard, supporting yeah. all the components on there. It's probably going to a power converter. Yeah. Where? Yep. Okay, so test the speakers now. Let's do it. Did Let's find, find some. Uh, how about how about Tobu? Uh, oh man. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I yeah, mean it's got it, bass, it's, right? It's so difficult to find good music to test uh, speakers with on yeah. YouTube. I remember um, like, tweeting at Tobu a few years ago, uh, complaining yeah. that his music had not enough dynamic range, and Tobu actually replied to me, saying, "Oh, that was a, mm. that was an old song. I've improved now," <laughs> and he did. Oh, wow. That's a... <laughs> I liked I liked that a lot. I appreciated his uh, his response. Wonderful. Okay, I'm gonna load up some uh, some sample music from uh, my collection. These are like from the YouTube library, so they should be good to use. Um, uh, T Quick says power is going to power external devices, like the exchangeable ports. So. Do so. Do, do the do any of the ports you put in actually have active electronics in them? Um, I mean, I can unplug them and and and, and make sure. So, so, I mean, like, yeah, that's we've got a good two point USB Cs, um, and so the USB Cs are pass through, right? And then the, the HDMI ones, uh, the HDMI one, I think, could be power. Yeah, but I. Didn't have it plugged in. I, I mean, I didn't have the cable plugged in. I just had the yeah. Module. But it, some some of those, surely some of those don't influence power yeah. management. Is it warm? I can't tell from what whether it's just the warmth of the overall laptop. All right, we're gonna um we're gonna take out all the all the port modules and test again. Yeah, cause that that uh that's a that's a good point. So normally on normal computers you can't. <laughs> <laughs> yep. You can't just start taking out hardware to save power. <laughs> yeah, this is fun taking. I, I, yeah. So so you know nice. it turns into such a double edged sword. You know, if this actually reduces power, you know, is that a good thing? Like you know, it, does it, because it says that the ports waste power at the same time as it says you can do something. Right. But, you know, the ports waste power. Okay, so uh, I'm noticing no change. Maybe, actually, maybe a little bit of change. Oh, interesting. So now the discharge rate is 4.7. 4.7. So we, we dropped gained... down like we the discharge rate decreased by about one watt. So we gained a watt by unplugging ports. <laughs> this is a I guess this is like the best discovery <laughs> of this live stream. <laughs> Signature ports... framework laptop discovery. Power. Yeah. Um, the, the we're, we're at negative uh, 3.8 now. That's more than a watt. That's like, that's like two to three watts now. So uh, yeah, that's two long watts. story short, the 
Quartz consume power. Oh no. Yeah, okay, so oh, I, just, I just to I make know. sure this is uh, not a fluke, I'm gonna plug the HDMI back in. I'm gonna gradually plug all these different ports back in and um, let it settle. Okay, so the so, HDMI, so this is... the HDMI uses one watt. Okay, so, so, because well, we're back that we're back up from like 3.3 to 4.4. <laughs> so, so here's, here's some, so this is the problem with frameworks design. They're using type C ports internally to connect to external, these ports. Now, normally on a normal computer, that HDMI port is connected to the GPU, which means when you're not using it, it simply powers down. The problem with connecting it with USB mm -hmm. is that USB power management can be a little more complicated. Mm. So like a USB card reader, you know, you've ever, have you ever had a USB key plug in? and it just gets warm after a while oh yeah i have uh, i've been using today the uh the usb drive um and uh it is um quite warm whenever i plug it in yeah so so that's sort of the problem right? uh, so when you're on usb power management becomes a problem because now everything's a usb device yeah and also isn't Well, this could be big if the SD card are also power. Hey, isn't um, isn't USB C like doesn't it natively support DisplayPort within USB C? But HDMI has to go through an active conversion. Yes, yes. Oh, uh, so that, that, that's the uh, zero point eight. HDMI is active. Saying. Yeah. So. Yeah, and and you know you know how every US HDMI adapter you can get off Amazon it gets warm. Yeah, that's what's happening here, I guess. Yeah, so that's kind of a... All right, so verdict. Keep keep your HDMI module in your backpack. Don't leave it plugged into your framework all the time. Otherwise, you'll drain about 0 0.8 extra watts. But now we're back to dongles. <laughs> yeah. But aren't we just back to carrying dongles again? Yeah, I feel like in this way, this it's actually worse. Kind of, like, this it's worse than kind a less an, repairable laptop that has the ports already. This is like an oh no kind of discovery, <laughs> in my opinion. <laughs> because this is a, oh wait, that wasn't a good idea. Yeah. You know. Oh, um, so I will try, um, forgot to try this other one. Because, I mean, I wonder if the SD card slot wastes any power. So I have the SD card plugged in now and nothing else. Is there a card in the slot or just nope, the... no card? I'll let it settle down. Well, I mean, it probably does use something because we were at like five points. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. By the way, this USB drive I'm using, it gets so hot, it's like 60 degrees. Yeah. Just idling. So here's the other question. Is it, is it the actual device using the power, or is it the fact that you're using any device at all? Hmm. Okay, so with the SD card plugged in, I feel like this is a poorly controlled test. Um, right now we're at 5.4 watts. Uh, and this okay. is the with the HDMI now out. So the SD card okay. seems to be using, the SD card reader, empty, seems to be using even more power than the HDMI port. So what happens if we unplug it? Okay, I'm plugging it again. It's not, uh, I guess it takes a little getting used to unplugging these without looking at them. Okay, so let it settle. We were at like five and a half. Now we're down to about four and a half. 4.4. That's 4. a lot of power. 4.3. Still dropping 4.2. 4.1. 4.0. And we're back down to 
the threes. 3.9, still dropping. 3.8. So. That's a lot of power. We went from, again, 3.8 to 5.5. <laughs> this is more than one watt of power for this empty micro SD card slot. Uh, do you actually do you actually have something on your... Nope, do I don't. Have a, what do you call that? Do you have a USB-C to A adapter on anywhere? Uh, I have, yeah, I have the USB-A module. No, not a, oh, a USB-A module. Yes. Uh, try plugging one of those in. Okay. That should not have active electronics in it, but it will enable the 5 volt power. Oh, you're saying like if you're you're saying the difference between having zero modules and having some module at all. Yeah, well, it has to be like a module that actually, you know. Okay, I mean there might be like 0.3 watts of difference because we went from like 3.7 to 4.0 now with uh, at, you know after I plugged in the USB A module. So perhaps the that's the difference of the bus coming live. I mean, this is not like conclusive testing. Yeah, I mean, you it's, know, it's very it poorly really controlled. Looked, it, you know, so so actually, but you know, this is a good point from. Uh, from T quick in the comments, actually, uh, you know, um, the external device actually do consume what it looks like noticeable amounts of power. Yeah. That's a, uh, that's actually a huge amount of power to just be throwing away like that. Yeah. I wonder if they can fix that in like a driver or something, turn these things off when you're not using them. Okay, so um, I have everything plugged back in. You know, oh, oh, here, here's a very, um, I guess, caveman style way of indicating whether or not your module is an active module is when you plug it in, you get the Windows dun 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 sound. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and that's how you know. That's how you know if it's a if it's a uh, active one. Yep. So the SD card is indeed active. Yeah. Okay. So I'm gonna go in here and uh, play some test music. No waves or anything on. There's no waves. No max audio. No. Right, no audio effects of any kind. Uh, I guess you're hearing this from my Rode Wireless Go, um, which is not indicative of anything. Not very loud. Uh, actually, very, very quiet. Oh, I have the... Uh... Oh, now we're loud. Okay, good. I thought I had maximized the volume, but I hadn't. Because that was the... Uh... Uh, it sounds very... Mm. Okay, so here, here's what I'm hearing. I'm hearing an inkling of bass, of the lower, you know... An the... inkling. Yeah. So I think the, the driver is capable of some bass, but um, mm. there has been no attention paid to frequency response correction. So the speaker is just naturally tinny. And Does it get very loud? It's it's pretty loud. Uh, it's like louder than I need at this distance. Uh, so it has so, the headroom to be corrected, I think. But the question remains, you know, what is the amount of distortion at those lower bass uh, frequencies? So interestingly, because here's the thing, uh, I think one of the main differences, in my opinion, mm -hmm. could be that there's no smart amp mm. uh, functionality. I there's mean, there's no smart amplifier, and a lot of the top performers use a smart amplifier. Yeah, well, there's there's software alternatives like Dynamic Q, which get pretty close. Uh, yeah. Well, actually, the 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 main difference with the hardware is that with the hardware ones, mm -hmm. they drive the speaker itself harder. Yes, that's that's correct. And 
you need that electrical boost. Yeah. To uh, yeah. They're able to maximize that that um, that output with, without uh, reaching the uh, li excursion limits, etc. They're able to like ride along that that fine edge, right? That very limited yeah, uh, sure. in a more finely controlled manner. So fully utilizing headroom. Uh, so I'm playing a 90 hertz test tone sine wave. I don't hear anything. I hear it. I don't hear um, anything. The, uh, you know, we, we, have a, we have a lot of high passes between us, but I hear it. It's there. And it sounds actually kind of clean. Oh, this is not good. Okay, so. Uh, let me report what is happening here. So uh, I'm getting I'm getting a rattle, excited by the speaker on the right side of the laptop, and I'm putting my hand on the keyboard, and it's it doesn't seem to be it doesn't seem to be the keyboard rattling. Something in the laptop is getting excited by the by the speaker. And it sounds kind of like a, it sounds like a um, electric shaver. It sounds like a phone uh, like vibrating. A, I mean, razor, table. I mean, electric razor. Um, sounds like an electric razor. And this, uh, this excitation, this uh, distortion, this noise, Goes goes up all the way to the uh, to about three hundred hertz. So between, like, between like one one fifty to three hundred, that entire range has this very obnoxious rattle. I mean, you don't hear it with actually, normal that, music, but with um, like male voices, you could actually hear that. I think so. That three hundred hertz range, mm -hmm. that's actually a very important. Right? Yes, that's, that's like actually in the, the voice fundamental band. of male here's voices. The, no, here's the second problem you're gonna have. Mm -hmm. If your speakers distort that much in the voice band, mm -hmm. audio conferencing applications oh, could have problems yes. with echo cancellation because echo cancellation relies on having under a certain amount of distortion. Right. Because you can't really predict for it, yeah, it won't account for extraneous you can, uh, noises. Yeah. Yes, it can only it can only it can only optimize it, like equivalent like an EQ or something. Yeah. It can't un it can't unharmonicify yeah. things. So that could be a potential problem. I mean. It I don't notice it with normal instrumental music. I'm, I'm gonna try to pull up like some, uh, some clip. Here we go, we're rolling. What's up? Good to see you guys. This is old do. Joe Rogan it's episode. It's weird to meet somebody when you watch a lot of the- You're real, and you're, I can touch your hands. <laughs> That's how I feel about you. <laughs> Let's, you yeah. know, we all feel about- Okay, um, I don't hear it from the conversation. It might just be the voice of the particular person. Um, but this is definitely an issue because it should not occur no matter what the test tone is. If there's any test tone that makes this happen, it's, it's not good. Um, so speakers, I think mechanically they're, they're ha they have potential, but I think what's happening here is a lack of proper isolation between the speaker and the rest of the chassis. And so the speaker is just, just like in the uh, MateBook X Pro, it's causing the the chassis. It's it's kind of clacking against the chassis, is what's happening. Actually, yeah, that's it is, kind of what I was pointing yeah. out. Actually, it's it's a little different than the MateBook X Pro because the MateBook X Pro is is the um, the keycaps vibrating. This one, I put my hand on the keycaps to make sure they're not you know to kind of stabilize them, uh, to rule them out. Still, the 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 rattling continued. So it's not the keycaps. It's the chassis itself, which may actually be easier to fix with, for example, placing foam or sponge-like material between the speaker and the chassis. Oh yeah, for sure. But looks like some work. Yes, engineering required. <laughs> engineering required. The magic and, and unfortunate words. Yes. All some right. engineering required. Yeah. 
And so with that, um, I think that's a good conclusion to end this live stream on. The framework mm. laptop, is it good, is it bad? It's engineering required. It's definitely not perfect. Uh, as we have seen uh, a few problems, uh, especially towards the end of the, live, end of the live stream, battery drain caused by the modules. Uh, still, we, we still need to confirm how bad it really is relative to other non-modular implementations. Our current guess is that because it's modular or because of the way that framework has implemented it, it poses significantly more drain than w what we would usually see. But regardless of the reasons and how it compares, we know now that uh, the HDMI port and the SD card slot each consume over one watt extra power when plugged in, even if there's no other device plugged into those modules. Just the modules themselves uh, pose a one point something watt power drain increase, which is like 20% more uh, uh, considering you know, the laptop baseline. Yeah, uh, also adding on to that, uh, probably highlight, uh, Brendan Seabrook also noted that um, this computer doesn't have any XMP, so your memory is stuck at um, 2666. Right. And uh, is this something that can be volts. fixed with a firmware update? I think I think he says it's uh, due, due to voltage. You need 1.2 volt RAM. Mm. Okay, I guess... Well, okay, if I so if I end up keeping this laptop, I will have to buy a uh, different RAM to make it work. Yeah. Um, let's see what else. Performance is great for for you know compared to most other laptops out there. You know, sustaining happily twenty eight watts. That's that's not bad. You know, that that's among the best within the size class. Um, but keyboard not the best. It's a little mushy for my liking. No touchscreen. That might be a deal breaker for some it's a less conv it's it's a minor annoyance for me uh what else speakers problematic engineering required uh, as we just discovered um resonance with the chassis uh is what we currently think it is so uh yeah those are some problems with this framework laptop and again overall for the i mean the build quality it's it's like a $500, $600 laptop build quality, I would say. I mean, it's not the worst. It's not, it's, it's metal, it's aluminum. So it's better than the bottom, very bottom tier, you know, uh, and older HP laptops, for example. But there's definitely, um, you definitely don't feel like this is like a totally premium computer. If you're paying, you know, over a hundred, uh, I mean, over a thousand dollars for it, this will not feel like more than a thousand dollars. I feel like, I feel like, you know, if, you know, if this was like my work lab and mm -hmm. I had to use it, you know, I, I don't think I would have it. I would probably say, well, it's fine. It's a work mm -hmm. laptop. But, you know, if, if I were to choose, I, I just feel like this, I mean, repairability wise, it's, but at the same time, th there is competition. Now, yeah. For sure. So, like, this, this you know, here, here's what I would say about the whole repairability topic. It's, it's the same thing that I have said in the past uh, to my friends about ruggedized phones. Uh, phones like the Kyocera or the Mobifox or the Galaxy Active series. A ruggedized phone is only worth it when like, you actually have a phone inside that's worth protecting. Otherwise, you have this you know, very uh, protected phone but what is it that you're actually protecting, right? If the phone itself is not a good phone, then why is it worth recognizing in order to prolong its life, uh, to make it more resilient to, to, to your environment? Same thing with the repairability of computers. If this is not a good laptop in, in an objective sense, like just a good laptop period without even considering the repairability aspect, if it's not good, if it's not something that you would feel comfortable with using, then what's the point of making it repairable? What is there to repair? What is there that's worth repairing if it's not a good laptop to begin with? What is there to upgrade if there's no potential to be a great upgrade? Uh, what is there to expand if at the end of the day, the chassis or the overall experience can never be so good? 
And so that is, I so think, I the main problem that framework is facing right now. And that's the challenge that they've bravely taken upon is to not only make a repairable laptop, but a good laptop overall. So I just sort of wanted to add on to that. You know, I think the concept is great, but I think the main, I think the main takeaways, I think the main marketing point of this laptop and why they say it's repairable is actually simply because you can swap the ports. Uh, right. the, swapping the ports seems to be sort of like the big thing about this computer. <laughs> but I don't, I don't, I wouldn't say it's necessarily, I wouldn't say that repairability of this laptop is significantly different. Yeah. From well, I think other the biggest laptops difference, in the market Larry, is, yeah. is not the ports or the fact that the RAM is modular or anything like that. I think. The biggest difference between this laptop uh, in terms of right to repair, et cetera, to others is not the physical things, but rather the company's attitude. I think that's okay. actually more significant yeah. than what they're offering physically, um, you know, what's modular or not, right? Uh, because that's because yeah, other laptops can come pretty close in terms of modularity, except for the ports, right? Like you have, um, Take the uh, MechRevo F1 or um, whatever else, you know, the NV series or whatever. Um, they can have, you know, modular RAM and modular SSD, which is the same thing here, right? Um, companies like uh, Dell and Lenovo will sell you a lot of components, internal components to you, to the end user. So you can do some upgradability. For example, you know, I had... Um, I had an XPS 13 with a short SSD, and then I upgraded it to a to a long SSD, and that required a different heatsink. I was able to order this from Dell for two dollars, shipping included. Uh, so, so you know, I think a lot of the other companies are, come close in terms of what they physically offer, but I think their political stance, you know, their attitude toward the industry, that's where framework is leading. I think it's it's why we need framework in this industry right now is to push that right to repair envelope forward. I think that's why I appreciate the brand perhaps more than I appreciate the product itself. So we have uh, two more comments. Uh, Sylvie says ports are some of the biggest issues in aging laptops. Charging ports, for example, tend to die over time. Easy. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Charging ports, yeah, that's a pretty good example. So um, actually that's a, that's a good comment because yeah. i think one of the one of the other things is it's not necessarily the ports that die but it's actually because of the way the ports are mounted to the motherboard they actually put a lot of stress on the connection between the port and the mother with this design you have like a interposer in between yes so this could theoretically prevent failures as well because now you're distributing the force yeah that's right um someone says replaceable keyboard is huge most laptops have welded keyboards parents old hp envy keyboard died wasn't replaceable right so and i guess yeah. this is also price competitive spec for spec right or close to it because so, the so, yeah. long-term repairability aspect only makes sense um if the laptop overall makes financial sense right so on the other hand though there so the keyboard the keyboard's being welded so Here's the other question, though. As, mm -hmm. as we've seen in the review, the keyboard isn't exactly the, um, the highlight of this. Mm -hmm. So the, the question being, I don't know if, I don't know if you know, these oh, you're are talking necessarily... about aftermarket keyboards? You know, that would be a thing, um, though we haven't really seen historically. Again, engineering seen... required. <laughs> yeah. You know, the thing is... The other thing is you think about the keyboard being welded. Uh, I feel like keyboards being welded, in my personal, it, it could be an acceptable trade off in some cases. Uh, yeah, but it has to be, you know, like having a palm rest itself being attached to a keyboard. I think I don't think is a huge problem. Mm -hmm. Having an expensive palm rest attached to a keyboard or having a huge piece of machined aluminum attached mm -hmm. to a keyboard is a problem. Yeah. But I would say that if it's like a plastic computer, 
um, having a plate on top. But yeah, um, I was only saying that because with uh, if you didn't have to make board room, you can actually save a little space, and you could use that space to make the keyboard itself better. Right. So there is that angle. Yeah. Always trade offs. You know, yeah, I think, you know, at the end of the day, you know, there's in engineering, I think the more you get into it, the more you realize that there's no real free lunch. Yeah. There's no slam dunk way yeah. to do something. Oh, one last tidbit, Larry. I wish the headphone jack was a module because I know the headphone jacks can also break sometimes. Uh, Wait, oh, this head no, no, it's replaceable from the inside, isn't it? Because I forgot to look. I think I it's replaceable it from the inside. Be, yeah, yeah. Replaceable because the motherboard doesn't go that far. I think. Yeah, yeah. It's on a, it's on it's a, it's on a daughter, daughter board. So never mind. It's all I good. Think, headphone yeah. jack is I repaired. I think I know why the happy. headphone jack isn't a module. It's because the audio they wanted the audio chip to be on the board, not a, yeah, not a module. Well, actually, that would be pretty interesting. Like if if the only audio output was implemented through like a USB DAC, I guess that would be hmm, maybe more power consumption again. Because then you could get like all kinds of like hi-fi DAC solutions, right? I mean, here's the thing: you actually can get all sorts of solutions because it, these these modules are yeah, USB. Yeah. Yeah. You just have redundant. You just have redundant headphone jacks. But somebody's actually suggested it all, already in their community. Oh, like, they want an audio <laughs> like a, like a balanced four point four millimeter um, jack or whatever. Yeah. yeah, all kinds of fun stuff. So I think there's definitely an audience for, for the framework laptop. I think there are people that um, would consider this to be the laptop, the best laptop for them. I think that that's definitely true for a lot of people. Um, for me though, oh, yeah, people. I, I, yeah, I, I, my, my main priority is uh, the best performance in the smallest form factor. Okay, I don't want, to, I don't want too small of a screen, but within like the 14 inch, form factor, the best performance uh, to portability ratio and uh, overall best quality, best ergonomics, etc. I just want the best laptop on day one. I actually don't care that much. I know this is going to be a little sacrilegious to some of you who are my more, who are more financially uh, uh, smart, I guess, than me. But I swap out laptops like every year or every half year. So um, I, I'm going to stick with, you know, less repairable laptops that offer more on day one. Uh, than this one, which can admittedly last a lot longer. So it may make sense for you. That is for you to decide. Um, me, I'm probably going to pass on this one. I might actually keep it, keep it though, because it's it's fun. You know, it's fun to tinker with. It's um, it's got a lot of functionality. Uh, it's a great platform to experiment. So I might keep it, but probably not going to be my daily driver. That's my verdict uh, for the day one review of the framework laptop. All right, Larry, um, you want to close out and uh, say goodbye to everybody? I'm going to end the stream. We're at three hours. Yeah. Well, um, thank you for having me. This is a this is a interesting uh, yearly stream, actually. <laughs> uh, uh, this had something new for this year, a little bit of a change from uh, all the, the mate books of past streams. Yeah. Um, I mean, you guys I might think, not have seen, but yeah. I, I've gone through like seven different laptops in the past two years. Uh, most of them did not result in, I mean, almost all of them did not result in reviews. They weren't good enough to even be reviewed, I guess. I just didn't, you know, didn't really consider them. So um, anyway. But overall, you know, overall, this is an interesting I yeah. definitely think uh, there's a lot to be learned from playing with it. Uh, yeah. I mean, I think, you know, hopefully some of the things we went are helpful to someone if, you know, if you're on the fence about it. You know, should I get it? Should I wait? You know, yeah. Uh, I would say, you know, I would hope someone can take something home from this. Yeah, um, it works. Yeah. It works well. You know, every, everything works on it. <laughs> so, so you know, that's good. And it's also performant nope. as well. So, I think, I think if if you're if you're willing to make sacrifices in terms of build quality, uh, potentially battery life, um, and and some of the other things that we mentioned, including speaker quality. Uh, in exchange for more repairability, flexibility, upgradability, etc., all those abilities, um, then it might actually be a viable option for you. Definitely. So I guess it's a you know it's 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 a statement is what I would say. Yes, it, that it's also. A, it's a yeah. statement more than a product. It's it's a statement and it's a statement and it's 
better if you can it's better with well it's it's a statement and it you know some engineering required yep yeah and so, with that um thank you all for tuning in to today's live stream um check out larry's channel by clicking on my channel and going to the channels tab larry's channel will always be linked to there he does teardowns reviews etc lots of cool stuff um larry thank you so much for joining uh as a co-host on the stream and uh, to everyone, if you haven't subscribed already, help me get to 5,000 subscribers. We're at 4.96 right now. We only have about 40 left to reach 5,000. So share, the, uh, share my channel with your friends or whatever um, if you see anything interesting going on on this channel. Um, stay tuned for more uh, projects coming up. I have more car mods, laptop mods, and uh, a whole lot more in the works. So stay tuned and I'll see you guys next time. Bye. Thank you.